you know, it's one of these moments where a person feels extremely fragile and the very expensive shit that's around them looks very, very inviting <laughs> to break. <laughs> so obviously, uh, I just gave one of the best live streams I've ever, have ever done. And I talked about things that were on the fly, typical me. And even I was in awe of some of the shit that came out of my mouth tonight. But unfortunately, something happened with the audio. And I don't know what it was. It wasn't the headset. It was something of the OBS. And I don't know what it is that I did wrong. The only thing I was doing was changing and transitioning from one chart to the next. So what I gathered by what everyone's saying in the tweets is apparently when I went to the Euro dollar, the audio was lost. So that's pretty much the majority of what I was talking about. So that kind of bites. So I'm going to go to the Euro dollar chart. And I guess you can just use the live stream, scrub over to the... Uh, the portion where it shows the euro dollar chart, the five minute chart. And I guess for most of you that have been with me for a long time, you really didn't need me to say anything. When I was pointing at the chart and showing you the dollar index at the bottom of it, you already knew what I was saying. So unfortunately I had some really good one liners that come to me naturally on the fly. And I didn't have the recording. Like sometimes I'll do the recording with the OBS. I was rushed to get everything put together, more specifically with all the annotations on the Euro dollar chart before I started the stream. So I forgot to push it. So <laughs> it's what it is. Sorry. But uh, because I'm not doing anything tomorrow and I want to make sure you have something and to close out this week together and not just half-ass it because it's, it's not my nature to do that. I want you to look at the Euro dollar five minute chart. And what I was going over is how that Judas swing that starts with the bearish breaker in the Euro, in the European zone, um, your Euro kill zone for London that run up to purge the buy side liquidity. If you add that fib, like I showed in the video, it gives you a standard deviation of negative three, which essentially is the low of the day. Uh, that's forming when we're looking at Forex. And this is what I was talking about when I had to chart up in ES, the daily low or the daily high isn't, framed easily like it is with Forex. Like usually Forex will pretty much cap the entire daily range by noon New York local time. And I mentioned, I'm not sure if it made its way into the live streams audio, but I changed my time setting at the bottom of the charts. So that way it shows real 12 hour time, not 24 hour, and but it's still local New York local you know, New York local time. So that way, when I'm talking about very specific times, it will be easier to see it based on the lecture notes that everyone sees on my YouTube channel, because I've been very often confused with talking to students all around the world in different time zones. And when they ask me about certain things, I get lost in the conversation because they're trying to use their local time. And it, it's very difficult and confusing for me to try to articulate certain things that occur. So I force everyone to have this perspective. So I made a change, which is going to be, I'm sure, problematic for everyone that's been utilizing the tweets or if they come to them after the fact, because I'm talking about 24 hour time, which is easily converted. But you'd be surprised how a lot of people don't know that. And it's going to be another source of confusion. But this way, hopefully going forward, 
you know, it'll be a lot easier, at least for me. So it has to be easier for me to, to do this. And as long as I'm not confused about who I'm talking to and about what I'm talking about, everybody else should be able to catch up, you know, over time. But on Forex, the range typically is capped by London close. And that's 10 o'clock in the morning to, to noon. I'm sure some of you will be sending me a message on TradingView asking me what the indicator is that's plotting the New York open, the London close, and the London open kill zone areas on that euro dollar chart. And I draw my things out manually. Is it, I, I like doing it, so you know, I don't like having indicators plotting shit for me. Fair value gaps, I know which ones work, so I don't want an indicator that's going to plot every single one of them because that's not going to be beneficial. Um, in fact, it'll draw your attention to things in the chart that are not really pertinent to what the market's doing right then and there. So I'm not a fan of, and it's no disrespect. I know there's a few of them out there that have respect for me, but are creating indicators that are being shared on TradingView. I'm, I'm not of the opinion that that's a good thing. So I'm making that known. I'm not trying to say, don't do this because I'm, I'm providing the information. I don't care if you're getting grocery money with it. I don't care. Okay. I'm just saying, I don't believe that that's the right way to do it because you're going to be plotting every single separation between three, you know, three candles with one in the middle and calling that a fair value gap. And it's not that that's not, that's not valid. Okay. So you'll learn more about it as we go throughout this year, but in ES or stock index futures, uh, the, the range can go beyond what Forex can do at London close, it can encapsulate the daily range for Forex. But stock index futures can go beyond that. So where euro dollar and pound dollar and other foreign currencies, they may be done for the day. They made their daily range. Stock index futures can go beyond London close, which is why we have a PM session. And usually the PM session in Forex is this mute that doesn't do much at all whereas in stock index futures you'll have a whole lot more movement many times so for forex the daily range is encapsulated by the european uh kill zone or london open creating the higher low of the day and then 10 o'clock to noon new york local time that creates the opposite end of the range so if you look at that euro dollar chart i was talking about how it created the high and low of the day as i teach it in my content the algorithm man i, I had some really good discussion i shouldn't even say this because it's going to piss you off even more and it's pissing me off now because i had some really good points and i had a really nice out uh, uh not algorithm i had a nice I'm fatigued. <laughs> I'm fatigued right now. So I'm trying to uh, make good on not being able to deliver the audio. I had a really good analogy that as I was saying, I was like, this is, this is really good. This is going to be one of those top tier live streams where you, it was very educational. So I'm going to, when I'm done doing this, which is going to be nowhere near the level of delivery I did in that live stream, but you couldn't hear it. I will do a, Shotgun Saturday with most of the things I talked about that I can recall. So that way I'll kind of like recant all that stuff. But the euro dollar chart shows that bearish breaker and the divergence at that, at that third time it touched the bearish breaker. And you see that occurring at the 9.50 a.m during the uh, New York open kill zone. It's touching the low of that bearish breaker, that pink rectangle. As it hit that, that lower high in Euro was met with a lower low in dollar, which is not symmetrical. So that's s and divergence. And what I was stating at the time of the recording that you didn't hear was the fact that we've been looking for dollar index to go higher. And with it going higher on the daily chart, wanting it to go higher, we're expecting the euro dollar to be in a sell program. So all of its premium arrays would be what? Utilized for going short. And we can ferret out the better ones when there's real distribution in euro 
when we see the dollar index not confirming. So in a perfect world, that dollar index should have made a higher low when the lower high was being formed on euro dollar right at the last time it touched that bearish breaker and then went lower attacking the sell side below the lows formed at the six o'clock time in new york local time and then the standard deviation for the judas swing that starts in the bearish breaker up to the high where it says it's purged that buy side liquidity the standard deviation of negative three gives you the low of the day during the London close kill zone. So it's the fact that we're forming the expected low based on that standard deviation, but the time it hits it, which is the London open kill, I'm sorry, the London close, that time meeting price, which is the standard deviation, when these two come together, then it's a complete picture. Then that's your that's your daily range. You're done. You can walk away feeling confident that you have the lines portion of the daily range behind you. And if it does move a little bit, it's probably going to be very small, minuscule movement. And then who cares about that? You can leave a little bit of you know meat on the plate. Let the retail traders go after that and break themselves going for it. The E mini S P. When I was showing the new week opening gap chart, I was talking about how these imbalances on the, on the fair value gap theory, but applied to the gap that's created from Friday's closing price and Sunday's new opening price. And the midpoint of that, which is consequent encroachment, how they act as magnets for fair value. The, the algorithm will sweep up to and down to old New week opening gaps, and you're placing a minimum of the week you're trading right now, last Friday's closing price and Sunday's opening price. They have to be there, and then four weeks going back. So there's five of them constantly on your chart. You're welcome to have as many as you can keep on your chart and you know, not lose sight of the candlesticks. But I keep personally, I keep five the week I'm in right now, and looking back, four more. So that's what's on my chart, okay? Uh, the new day opening gap, I have that every single day. I have a template that shows every single new day opening gap. So you want to, in trading view, you want to create those templates. And I think there's a limit to how many you can create on different tiers of subscription level. I, I, I don't know what those are. And I know some of you aren't willing to pay. And I'm not saying you should. I don't get a kickback for it. I'm just saying I'm using this medium. Some of you are always complaining about, you know, trading view this and you know, why don't you use this and why don't you use that? I used to use MetaTrader when I was just teaching Forex alone. And then when it was shown to the world that it's manipulated and you can fake it, I didn't want to be a part of that. So I asked the community, which platform should I use collectively? And majority of them said trading view. That's the only reason why I went to trading view. I didn't look at trading view and said, oh, wow. I used what everybody in the community said as a majority. So that's why we're here. So all I'm trying to do is find a medium that allows everyone to see the same thing. And that way, if I'm doing something, if, if they ask a question about what it is that I'm doing with my chart, since I'm using TradingView and I'm asking my students while learning with me, at least this year, you know, follow along on TradingView. Once you learn how you're supposed to do this, then you can go trade whatever you want to use, Ninja Trader, you want to use Trade of Eight, you want to, whatever it is that you want to use. It still works because we're looking at the open, high, low, and close. And there's nothing in TradingView that you can't find somewhere else. It just makes it easier for me as an educator when I'm teaching that we all have the same laboratory instruments. So everything is the same. You're, you, you see everything the same way I show it. That's the only reason why I'm doing this. Trading view lags, okay? And this is what I was talking about during the, the live session too. There's there's things that you, you're going to have to contend with just like I contend with it. And when I can't get out of a trade, even though it's paper, that ideal scenario of me getting out right then when it's supposed to happen, sometimes trading view prevents that because it lags. And just it won't let me do what it is that I'm trying to teach you to do because there's a lag. 
and I don't know what causes it. And I'm sure they've been told by other people, but even with those gremlins that creep into this, okay, you can see that there's a rhyme and reason as to what price is doing and it's repeating. And I talked about the new week opening gap since I mentioned it and this, you know, opened the discussion about it the last two weeks. There's a lot of attention around it, interest and the new day opening gap and the consequent encroachment of, of those two respective imbalances. And now I taught the implied fair value gap. And yes, there's other things. And I thought about, you know, trying to release one new thing each week. And it, it kind of hit me earlier this afternoon. I was taking a drive with my wife and she asked me what I was in deep thought about because I was quiet. She's, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just thinking about what I want to do you know, next week. And I started talking to her about it. And she said, don't you think this is a lot of stuff? Like, this is a lot of stuff. And if even the people that have been with you the longest time, if they don't know this stuff, the new students that are coming to you right now, I'm going to inundate you with stuff that's going to constantly have you spinning your wheels and you won't learn how to use it effectively. So I think we have, I think I might do two more, two more concepts that are brand new, but what we have now with the core content, last year's model, and the introduction of the new week opening gap, new day opening gap, and the implied fair value gaps, we have enough weapons to make you a savage. We, we can do that. I didn't need to do what I've done in the last two weeks, just using what it's already on the YouTube channel. I can make you into a consistently disciplined speculator. I can do that. That doesn't mean that you're going to be profitable because that, that has to happen with a live account. And I'm not telling you to do that with live money ever. You have to make that decision. So when we look at these new week opening gaps, I spoke on the topic of how it goes back to constantly referring to them as a dynamic fair value. So the concept still is fair value. It's going back to these levels because it is utilized to inspire large fund sentiment, not retail stop me out. It's to inspire fair value for large institutional investors that bring money into the marketplace because it comes back to these levels knowing that typically they use the analysis of the previous week. And if the market has moved away from those levels, the algorithm prices in and it's coded to allow it to re price back to those levels to offer opportunity for large flows to enter the marketplace. Not that large flows pushed price to these levels. It's going to go to those levels regardless of how much buying and selling is going on. But when it happens, it's designing the very stage for participants to come into the marketplace, have real orders right then and there. And then the counterparty dance between smart money and the less informed trader begins. So I've talked about how, if we go to the E-mini S&P template that I use when I'm trading, It's the one that has the hourly chart in the upper left-hand corner, the 15-minute chart in the lower left-hand corner, and in the one-minute chart. So if you go to the video on the live stream, I'll give you a moment to scrub over to the one minute where I expanded it large. Let's give me a minute so you can do that real quick. All right, so one minute E mini S and P futures contract chart, and I have all my annotations on it. I was talking about how this morning on the live stream that I was sharing my coaching session with Cameron, I outlined and I banned two people, blocked two people on my Twitter account that sent me a tweet saying that I was talking about the direction both ways, and then when I came back, I said must be random. 
if you don't listen to the live stream intently and understanding what I'm outlining, I'm giving you a narrative, what I really want to see. Every time I talked about where the market was likely to do this or do that, I would say, but I don't want to see that. I want to see a run up into that fair value gap on the hourly chart. I kept going back to that. That is me telling you, like when I say on Twitter, I'll say gun to my head, or if I'm in my commentaries, when I was doing the commentaries for my students, if I have a period of time where if I happen to be in front of them, I'm doing analysis, which was every day. If there's a time when I know I'm between analysis points where there's nothing I can do right now because I'm waiting for more information. It just means I have to wait. I have to exercise patience. There is no setup right now. Or I don't have a clear bias as to what I want to do at that very moment. Just because the time says it's time for another video. The market's sometimes saying there's time to be doing nothing right now. So therefore, instead of being in my opinion, rude as an educator, because I can always find something to teach and talk about. I didn't want to just say, there's no trade to just be, be patient. The only time I ever did that is when I wasn't well, I was sick and I lost my voice or just didn't feel well. Uh, that's the way it was. It was just, you know, there's no session. But because I was always doing commentary, if it was between a time when the market was suggesting to me there was something obvious to do, then I would say, okay, this is what it would happen if it's going to go higher. This is what it's likely to do. Otherwise, it might do this. And I don't know which one it's going to do. So we're what? We're in low probability. But even in those instances, I would say, gun to my head, that means I have to co-sign right now, even though I wouldn't commit with a trade going into this. If I had to say right now, based on what the charts are saying, at the very moment of me talking about it over the charts and analysis, I always share my view. I was doing that live on the one-minute chart with the ES this morning. I kept outlining, okay, if it does this, then it would negate the idea or interest for me to go up into that fair value gap. If it trades down here to that buy side imbalance, sell side inefficiency, which is those two, uh, those two dark blue lines dead center at 4005 and 4001.5, that's that 15 minute fair value gap. It's a buy side imbalance, sell side inefficiency. And I was talking about how if it went down there and traded below 4111.75 before 930, it completely negates the whole idea that I would expect that 60 minute fair value gap. Now, for someone that's looking for trades, that's looking for the, the deciphering of how can I take a trade based on what he's saying right now, or for someone that's listening. And not really trying to learn. They're looking for something to evaluate from a transactional basis only. They hear two sides of, this, you know, of the same coin. And it's 50-50. And whatever happens, ICT is going to come back on Twitter and there it is. No, man. No. Okay. I literally said that, that I am telling my son. I said, I want it to go above 40-25. Trade up into the 40 30s because of that 60 minute fair value gap. That's my trade. That's what I wanted. I outlined every potential scenario that could have unfolded this morning and I negated every single one of them, saying, I, I don't want that. I want the run up into the buy side and into that fair value gap. That's my trade. That's what I'm looking for. And I kept telling Cameron, we don't want to see this, but I said, that sell side liquidity pool that was formed in the lows between 5.30 and 6 o'clock, if you have that one minute chart up that I was sharing in the live stream, I mentioned, and it's in the live stream this morning, you can go back and listen to it. I said, I'm interested in seeing, do they take it down there just below it by a little bit, run those stops, and then reverse it and take it back up and keep it inside the range and then wait for 9.30 before they go into that fair value gap. I want to see that. And then I said in that live stream at 930, the initial move at 930 is the fake move. That's the Judas swing. Go back and listen to it. I can't edit it. It's live streamed. It's not a up, it's not an uploaded recorded video. It's time and date stamped. It says it's been live streamed. It was only one Michael in one 
time window between 8.15 and 9.04 this morning. I can't be in more than one place than one time. Okay. I'm not omnipresent. So I can only be there live talking about whatever it is I was thinking about. There was no extra chart somewhere else, other laptop supposedly recording another outcome. I was literally taking you into the mind of inner circle traders saying, this is what I'm looking at right now. I'm reading every single one of these candles and I'm telling my son, this is what we're looking for. This is what I want to see. And at 930, if that fair value gap, that red fair value gap that was on the 60 minute chart trading between what is it? I don't know what the hell that is. Uh, 40.33. No, that's not right. 40.30.25. That level, the fair value got low. The consequent encroachment was the midpoint. Uh, 40.30.25 or 50, so, something like that. That's consequent encroachment. And then the high of the fair value got, which is around... 40, 30, so I don't know what the hell that is. Forty thirty seven and a quarter. Okay. If nine thirty hasn't seen that fair value gap traded to yet, and we have a move going down after nine thirty, this is what I was outlining and talking about. That's a Judas swing, because I want to see it run into that sixty minute fair value gap. So if that's my trade and that's what I was outlining and everything I was outlining this morning, if it was against that idea, I said, but that's not what I want to see. Go back and listen to it. I'm hardlining it. There's no way any of you can fucking take that out of context. I was aiming, looking for price to go up to the buy side and dig into that 60 minute fair value gap. There is no fucking ambiguity at all in that. None. And so when I read these two jokers this morning talk about this shit saying, oh, see, this is why I get mad. And I can see how people get mad because it was like both sides were explained. And then he comes back and says this. And then I don't like the blind cheerleading that everybody does when they don't know what the fuck he's done or what's going on. People were fucking trading it. They knew exactly what the fuck was going on. So that's the kind of shit I talked about in the last Twitter space. If I see that kind of shit, I ain't got any fucking time for you. I'm banning it. I'm blocking it. I don't give a fuck what you think about me. OK, I'm not going to waste my attention on that kind of shit. If you think I'm a fraud and a scammer, go fuck yourself. OK, that's as plain as I can make it for you. Fuck you. Because I'm literally out here walking this shit live in a manner that nobody else has done before. And they ain't nobody can do it either. You can do it. Come out here and do it and do it when I'm doing it. And I'll do it 20 fucking five times better and more precise than you. I'm here for that. That's why I chose this medium, Twitter. All the drama started here. I'm back here ending it. I'm closing the fucking chapter. Nobody's closing shit on me. I'm doing it. So when it hasn't at 9.30, traded up in that 60-minute fair value gap, the initial move that you hear me describe in the 9.30 opening session, before I closed the session this morning, the live stream, while the GDP number was coming out, I was explaining that I don't want this to happen, but I want this to happen. If it does this, then I don't have a trade. I, I literally walked you through exactly how to look at the marketplace at 930. And you didn't need me, which is why I wasn't fucking there. <laughs> Hello. I had already outlined it. I've literally called the whole fucking narrative before it ever unfolded. That's foresight. That's ownership. That's authorship. That's fucking fingerprints all over that motherfucker. That drop down on the 15 minute time frame is dropping down into a 15 minute fair value gap. And it's also dropping down into a 15 minute order block that's bullish. Go to and look at your 15 minute time frame. That's what you watch me in this what was supposed to be a really good market review, <laughs> but you couldn't hear me talking. I was talking about how it drops down right into that fair value gap on the 15 minute time frame and stops to the tick inside of a bullish breaker that's on the one minute chart. So you have a bullish order block on the 15 minute time frame. You have a bullish breaker on the one minute chart. You have a 15 minute 
discount fair value gap that it comes down into perfect delivery to the low tech. And it's happening with the narrative I've outlined during the 820, 830 GDP number. I want to see the move that happens at 930. If that gap on the 60 minute chart that's red in the chart, if that has not been traded to yet, the fake move at 930, which would be what? Dropping. That's a Judas swing. And then you saw my son do what? He used everything I'm talking about here, but he's slow. So he didn't push the button until the next candle started running up. So that's why you see a sloppy entry. But he's learning, folks. He's, he's, he's just like you right now. He's learning how to do it. Just because I'm sitting right next to him doesn't mean he's going to have the exact entry points and precision that you see me doing when I'm doing executions. But he's using me prompting him saying, okay, do you see that right here? All right, right when it does this, you want to see. And then what he's doing is he's contemplating and he's wrestling with, okay, do I do it right now? Do I wait? And I'm, I'm yelling at him. I'm like, what are you waiting for? And click, he's clicking the button, but it's late. So I'm telling, I'm scolding him. This is what you don't want to do. Now, because you bought it when, it when it's an up candle, you've created an opening range between where you entered and where your stop loss needs to be. You're making larger risk for yourself. You don't want to do that. You buy in down close candles or candles that are going down. You can grow comfortable doing that. When it hits that low tick of that 15 minute fair value gap, at that moment, I'm telling him, this is, this is where you buy right now. And he's saying, but it's going down. How do I? And I said, don't question me. Don't question me. If I'm telling you to do something, I'm teaching you how to overcome your fear. You have to do what I'm telling you to do. Even though you may not trust it, this isn't hurting dad. It's not taking money away from me. So if you do it and it doesn't work out, it, it doesn't hurt you. And it doesn't hurt me. It's showing you how to do this conceptually where there's no money outcome to it that means anything no loss no no profit right which is the best learning medium that you can have when you're trying to do this kind of stuff so i told him i said inside that fair value you got on the 60 minute chart up in that red box i told him i said find a level that you feel like it can get to so he scrubbed it up and got to about 600 dollars because that's what he essentially gets in a bi-weekly paycheck at his job. He works at a coffee shop. So he says, I want to see if I can do what I get in two weeks. So he rolled it up there and I said, okay, we'll see what happens. I'm looking at that consequent encroachment. And this is the part of the, the discussion I was talking mostly about in this ES chart. Recently in the Twitter spaces, I talked about how, where when the market doesn't do something that you would normally expect, which would be what in this case, trade all the way up to the top of that 60 minute fair value gap. If it doesn't do that, doesn't that imply weakness? Yes. Not because the markets ran out of buyers, not because more sellers came in to muscle it lower with selling pressure. No. At that moment, when it trades up into consequent encroachment, 34.25 was where I told him, I said, you want to watch that level. How many times did it hammer that level? Multiple. At that very moment, it looked just like a retail bull flag. And I was telling him, I said, listen, look at the NASDAQ which is what I was showing you in this live stream tonight, but you can't hear me talking about it. But the students that have been with me for a long time, you know where my cursor is drawing your attention to. I, even though I'm not saying anything, you heard me saying, do you see how the NASDAQ made a, a lower low? I'm sorry, a lower high when the S&P made a higher high as it went up into that fair value gap? Oh, shit. If that's happening, when it went to the PD array in ES, which is what I was outlining this morning during the GDP number before 930 even came, I want to see it trade up into that level. That's, that's your premium array. And I said, there's nothing else up there that's an imbalance. So it's going to go up into that. That's your premium. But if it can't climb through the midpoint and we have a divergence between the uh, NASDAQ and the S&P, you have S&T divergence there. 
So what are we expecting? Look at the dollar index. Dollar index was saying, I'm going higher. I'm going higher. So if the dollar's going higher, it's risk off. With a SMT divergence, with a premium array that was outlined beforehand, absolutely one-sided during the GDP number being released this morning. We've been talking about the dollar going higher. Daily chart buys, uh, bias. It's going higher. It's going to keep digging up higher, higher, higher. So it tells you what? From a macro stance, higher time frame, bias, when you're looking to do a narrative, you start with framing a narrative with that logic in mind. Meaning, if dollar is in a buy program, we're expecting to keep pressing higher, 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 higher then everything else should be looking for shorts. So you open the day up with everything after the open. If it rallies, fade it. Once it goes to a level that we expect that would limit the upside, how far the rally up can go. Well, there's your 60-minute fair value gap I outlined. I didn't say anything higher than a nope. Go listen to the live stream. But then when it dug into it, the NASDAQ said, I ain't confirming this. I'm not co-signing this. You're on your own, ES. And it left it up there at the pinnacle of its daily high. But not before trading into that fair value gap I outlined this morning. So now we have ES at a premium high off of a Judas swing after 9.30. It met our objective, but more specifically, it couldn't even get to the upper end of it. It left the upper portion unfilled. When NASDAQ had a divergence, it made a lower high. At the same time, at the same time, if you look at the dollar index, dollar's bullish. So we have the perfect storm. S&P has gone to where I was expecting it to go to an outline beforehand on the basis of how I expected it to deliver. At the same time, NASDAQ failed to go higher with it. That's a crack in correlation. That's what smart money sees as the green light go, go in there and start shorting S&P. While the dollar rages higher intraday, that's going to allow what? The sell program in ES and NASDAQ to accelerate to the downside. The gap that I told you to do in your Twitter tape reading exercise today, which was at 10.06 a.m. New York local time on the one minute chart on ES. I told you to take that, extend that range to the right. And I told my son, when it gets into that, I want you to go short. As soon as it went in there, he, he sold short, which was you know, obviously incorrect. But I told him, I said, you have to use a five-handle stop loss, which is what he did. And then he got stopped out. And I told myself, okay, look, dad is going to trade this because it's trading above relative equal highs, which you hear me. Well, not hear me. I'm sorry. But you see me tweet. I said, I'm observing these relative equal highs that you know we just cleared right now. And I put him in again, and I explained to him, this is why I'm doing it, but the rest of the trade is you. Like, you have to do the rest of it. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But my concern is, if he trades this, I'm not going to mention the, uh, the company name, but you all know what one he sided with and which one he's going to go with. If he makes money in that, and this company comes forward and says to him, uh, we don't think you're doing this. We think your dad's doing it. Um, I'm just letting you know, company that I won't name here because I don't want to put anything bad against you right now because I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt that you're going to allow him to take the money he's going to fucking make in it out. If it's Mickey Mouse money and you see him losing here and there, you're going to know it's him. You're not going to see the level of trading you see me showing. So let him make his bread. Because if you fuck with me and him, 
I'm going to put your company on fucking blast and nobody will go with you. So just letting you know. So I put him in the secondary trade once he, he got stopped out. And I told him, I said, once you're in this, you have to manage it from here. I tweeted, I said, you know, where's the retail sell stops? Obviously, it's below the lows at the low of uh, 11 minutes after 10. So there's sell side there. And then the lows at 831. So 410 and 417 thereabouts, respectively. We had a drop out of that small little consolidation that was formed inside the fair value gap on the 1006 candle sharp drop and then it really quickly came right back up in that little area there and at that moment i told my son i said listen you might get stopped out here they might one more time run it up and that's why i told you note the fair value gap at 1001 i said note that i said it looks like it it could potentially rip higher here and i told you exactly if it's going to go higher it's going to go to that fair value gap it would stop us out and then he would have to trade another entry and i said right now where we're at here it's 50 50. it could spike up one more time and then ultimately roll over later on and do what you see here in the chart today and that's why i said right now where we're at we're 50 50. we are in a trade we were in a trade we had already seen him get stopped out and I put him in another one short. So it could have stopped me out by running into that fair value gap. Had it done that, I would have put him in one short there. It's only been, it was one contract. So it's not a lot of money at risk. And it's not a lot of money that he's going to make, you know, hypothetically, right? So I'm teaching him to work with one contract. And the goal is for him to understand that he doesn't need all the movement that he saw today. If he just gets, three to five handles once a day. He doesn't need his coffee shop job. And that's, I'm, sh I'm trying to start him with a humble beginning. He knows there's a lot of money that can be made in it, but he's also scared to death. And he's so scared to make a mistake to disappoint me. And it, I, I'm trying to keep that in the forefront of my mind as I'm teaching and coaching him, but I'm, imbalance so and i'm his dad too so if he doesn't listen to me i'm already going to correct him on that two if he's doing exactly the opposite of what i've said that he should be doing or not doing the things i told him that were paramount don't do these things because this is what you don't want to do which is what you don't buy up close candles or up forming candles expanding higher bullish candles we don't buy them we're distributing selling into that we're selling into that. Okay. So either we're selling with a new entry for a short or we're selling long positions as it's delivering that up candle. That's that market efficiency paradigm. Whereas when you look at retail logic, most of the time they're buying breakouts. That means they're buying up close, up thrusting markets. It's horse shit. It's bullshit. You're opening yourself up to risk. And that's why that shit fails more times than anything else. You have to get comfortable embracing uncertainty. But when you learn what it is I'm teaching you, it's not uncertain. It's specific. It's highly precise. It's not ambiguous. There's lots of things that I'm talking about when I'm doing tape reading because I want you to observe these specific reference points. But much like when you see me in live streams and in the Twitter uh, tape reading sessions, when I'm making a move, it's absolutely fucking obvious. I'm saying, all right. I like this. It's running to sell side here, and this is where it's going to go. This is the objective. They're very specific terms. If I'm saying note this, I'm saying reference this on your chart because we, we may need this in a, in a few minutes or later in the day. That's not the same thing as, oh, he's calling a fair value gap. When it gets there and it goes up to it, he's selling short there. That doesn't mean that. I might be referring to that level as it has to go through it and then come back down and find it as support. Much as much in the same way I mentioned this morning when we left that fair value gap that we turned back up to it. And I said, we can be 50 50 here and we can be stopped. And what I was saying is, is to him, I said, we might get stopped out again. But for you, you're reading tape. You're not supposed to be in a fucking trade. 
So I'm teaching you that if you are thinking there should be a trade there, right now is where you have to dig your heels in and accept that uncertainty. It's 50-50 right here. We need to see it break. And it needs to go down through the candle that formed that fair value gap at, 10, uh, at 830 this morning, New York local time, which is that yellow box on that one minute chart during the live session I showed you today. And I wanted to see it go down below that. And I said, note that extend it forward to the right across your chart. And we want to see it act as resistance. And damn it, I'm so fucking sharp with it. It was right on that one minute candle. Bumped it, resistance, off to the races we go. Just like it's supposed to. It's almost like it was following my fucking instructions. Almost like it was typed out in a source code that this fucking has to follow. Crazy how it works. It's just so crazy how these random things just keep falling into place every fucking day. And it trades down into what? The objectives of 4005, 4001.50, 39.88, smashed. And then ultimately accelerated throughout the rest of the day. And I saw a tweet from a guy, and I, I, can't, I don't know who his handle is on Twitter. He does a YouTube thing. I don't, I don't recall what his handle is. But he mentioned something to the fact that uh, I'm assuming it was like a backhanded remark about the implied fair value gap saying something that's going to cause people to lose money. So I was like, okay, apparently that means that this is a contrived thing. It doesn't exist. So I did it again today. I used it, traded with it and smashed it in later in the afternoon. So yeah, I, I get it. Okay. Everything I teach is not going to always warm up and give you butterflies and, and warm fuzzies, okay? Some of it's going to be feeling extremely complicated. If it feels like that, that's not your PD, right? That's not your multiplier. That's not your model. That's not your approach. Just let that one go. Somebody else is going to say, that's my shit. I'm, that's my thing right there. I'm going to roll with that one. That's the one I've been waiting for. And it's the same thing with the breaker, same thing with the fair value gap, same thing with institutional order flow entry drill, you know, order blocks, optimal trade entries, you know, whatever, mitigation blocks. All these things, you're not bringing everything to the trade with that. You're picking one that makes sense to you, and you're going to look for that every single time the market does all these movements. And if it doesn't give you yours, you'll miss the move, and you have to be content with that. It might not be fun when it rips off and tears off without you. But they repeat, and there's no reason, Patrick, to get upset. They keep repeating. This stuff repeats every day. And you have to filter out all the bullshit or you'll fall victim to distraction. And you won't see when your model delivers in price so you can act on it. And the market obviously, you know, broke down aggressively today and just kept delivering more and more and more lower prices. Ultimately trading down to the 39, what is it, 39? 75 and a half level, which is the standard deviation from the Judas swing of the daily range, which was the low formed at the 830 low all the way up to the essentially the almost 10 o'clock time window where it creates the high of the day inside the fair value gap. That range from that high down to the 830 low, if you take your Fibonacci laid across that and project the Fibonacci standard deviations, which is why I had my Fibonacci settings up there. Because I said, some of you are probably just watching this video for the first time and you want to know what my settings are because they don't look like your typical settings. You're right. I don't use retail settings. I'm looking at standard deviations because that's what the algorithm is going to do. It's going to do measured standard deviations within specific ranges. And I'm teaching you what ranges to use based on the time of day when they're going to be referred to by the algorithm. If there is no algorithm, this shit would not repeat, repeat over and over and over again to the tick every single day. Every day I'm coming to you. Every day. And I'm delivering fresh bread. Piping hot right out of the oven. And it's perfect. Everything I'm showing you is to the fucking tick. 
If there was no algorithm, there's no fucking way there is a retail logic that I could lean on and say, this is what I'm using to do that. And these jokers out there that are trying to discourage you, smear my name. They're jealous. They're envious because I'm showing you something that nobody's ever touched on before. And I'm proving it every day on a one minute by minute basis, which is the I mean, I can do it on a 15 second chart if you want. I mean, we can do that. Fuck it. I'm going to do it, too. I'm going to do that. And you'll see there's no way. There's no fucking way anybody can argue that there isn't an algorithm in these markets that deliver price. And it's all 100 percent controlled. And there's no reason to be upset about that. You see these jokers out there on CNBC. They say, oh, well, you know, the markets have transformed into these untradeable environments. And there's no liquidity out there now because the algorithms absorb it all. The algorithms are causing all the problems we have. Get the fuck out of here. Listen, listen, folks, listen closely. As soon as the markets became electronic, they have started at that moment to be delivered by an algorithm. That means it's all scripted. It's just like WWE wrestling. The outcome is already predetermined. And I know that chaps a lot of people's asses, especially the ones that work at financial uh, institutions, brokerage firms, banks. I used to be a trader at Barclays. And we look at all of you retail traders and we laugh because our candles have these things inside of it. Look at this. Come and learn from me. Bullshit. Bullshit. You're showing results even with the MyFX book and it's that little bit Mickey Mouse fucking money and you're thinking that's a big deal to talk about where you came from as Barclays. Barclays don't know shit. I'm out here teaching technical science. Okay? This is the real shit. This is the real to the degree of precision that you cannot see anywhere else. There is a fucking algorithm, and it's been there since we have had electronic trading beginning. And before that, when it was all open outcry, those open outcry traders were trading in a a price speed that they looked up at that board. That board told them, what? This is where we're at. So what are they trading? They're not making the fucking market. They're trading in the market that's being made for them. When you listen to these people say, I was a former or I am a market maker at this trading desk, at this firm, you are not making the motherfucking market. You are not making a fucking thing. You're making a list of transactions that you were counterparty to. But guess what? That data, that feed, that price that you're doing it at, it's being piped into you. You can't make up your own fucking price. You can't go outside the bid and ask, motherfucker. That's not, that's not making a market. You are dealing. You are a dealer. The market maker is piping that price feed into all these institutions and the brokerages. And they have to do what? Work within the scope of a bid and ask. And they can get their money that way. I'm aware I am aware of what you believe a market maker is. They got to be delta neutral. They they don't care. They're, they're just trying to provide liquidity. Yeah, I, I get that. But they're not controlling fucking price. I'm telling you where price is going to go. They have no fucking idea where it's going. I'm telling you a day before, a week before, a month before where the fuck it's going. I'm telling you to every minute by minute increment where it's going to fucking go. I'm fucking making these fucking markets, motherfuckers. I'm telling you right now, you need to wake the fuck up. We're no longer in Kansas, Alice. Alice? Did I say that right? (laughs) Dorothy, motherfucker, get it right. I'm thinking Wizard of Oz and Alice in Wonderland. This is that part where I would have control M in a recorded setting. And I'd say, okay, we're no longer in Kansas, Dorothy. So this is what it's like when you do it live. But I didn't have that mess up in the live stream. I, I had a really good one. Didn't have any reason to feel like I had to edit anything, but I'm tired and fatigued, so there it is. But listen, man. You have learned to wear these titles if you want to call yourself a market maker. I'm a former market maker. No, you're a dealer. The market maker is faceless. It's all AI. 
And sometimes the market will have these periods of manual intervention. That means a man gets involved and overrides what would otherwise be scripted for the day. I know it sounds unbelievable. There's no way that the market could have a high and low predetermined before the trading begins. And yet it is. How, how, how the fuck can I tell you where it's going throughout the day? Where it's going to go, how far it's going to go, where is it going to turn on every minute increment too? Allow me to say this, and I promise we'll move on. Listen. If there isn't an algorithm that I am absolutely fucking certain that my hands are all over, if there is no algorithm that is controlling and delivering price all day long, minute by minute, please, please, Come forward, explain to everyone what retail skill set I'm using every single time I'm doing this. What am I using to deliver this level of precision, foresight, and accuracy? Because if you can do that, you're going to save me a whole fucking year because then I can say, okay, do this. Take care. See you later. And I'm going to spend the rest of the year doing my RV traveling. <laughs> it, come on. Do me a fucking favor, please. But it ain't going to happen. That's why I've told you, roll your fucking sleeves up because we're going to be here all year long because there's nobody else with this. Nobody else has this. You're talking to the source of it. I'm sorry if that pisses you off. I'm sorry if it makes you feel like you got a little dick. I'm sorry. It's not meant to be like that. I'm here to help everybody that's willing to listen. If you want to learn how to do this, show up every day and you're going to see it. There's no competition here. I'm willing to teach anybody that's willing to show up. As long as you're respectful, that's, exactly, that's all I'm asking for. But there is an algorithm. It's so fucking painfully obvious if you look at it like this. Because if you are those financial professionals in this industry, and you wore tags and titles that were market maker this and market maker that. I'm not trying to be rude to you. I'm not trying to talk down to you. I'm just being straight and direct with you. You are a dealer with a misappropriated title because you're not controlling price. Price is going to go right on past wherever you thought it was dealing in. And you're doing transaction and offering the other side of trades for your clients, that's a momentary transaction. The script is already predetermined. You're just jumping on board and being a handshake for one trade or the next. That's it. You're not stopping price. You're not controlling. You're not changing direction of price. It's going to go where it's going to go. And you are just one small little cog in the machine that was going to deliver that price, whether you dealt in that commodity, futures, or market, whether you did your trades there or not, it's already predetermined. And that might be unsettling. And it's easy for people that work in that industry and say, this guy that you're listening to right now, me, this guy's full of shit because I worked at this bank, I've been doing this, I'm a former this and I'm a former that. Bring your former ass out here and you call every fucking minute move with me side by side and I will fucking show your ass everything you don't know. You think I'm out here just doing this because I like it? I'm waiting. Because I know there's some young fucking dick out there that thinks he knows everything because he got a position in some kind of institution. Bring your shit here and get schooled. You're only aware of what you've been indoctrinated in. They told you this is what happens. This is what you're doing. You're making the market. <laughs> it's no different from you buying these retail books. You're going to learn to do this and you're going to learn to do that. And then you get out there and you do what? You find out it's something entirely different. But it feels good to wear a title like I'm a market maker. You're not making shit. You're making deals. 
You're down transactions. That's all you're doing. You're not changing the course of price. You're not. You're absolutely not doing shit. You're doing what everybody else is doing. You're buying and you're selling. Oh, that's deflating, isn't it? But that's the reality. And you can't walk around and impress anybody when you strip it down to what the bare essentials of what it is you're doing. You're doing what? You're doing the same fucking thing that I'm doing. When I'm buying, I'm the other side of the other person selling short. That's what a dealer is. That's what the market maker is doing. He's making a book for his clients, but he's trying to do what? Stay delta neutral. I know all about that shit. But that's not market making. Market making is outlining where the price is going to go, when, how, and for what purpose. And then coding it and letting that shit go to town. And then it's done. And it just seems to be only one motherfucker able to talk about it like that before it happens every fucking day. I wonder who the fuck that could be. I wonder. I wonder who that person is. And would he be willing to spend time showcasing it for free just to get a test drive? That would be something, wouldn't it? That would be something if somebody could do that and make it available to be studied, observed, see if it really exists. Is it really precise? Does it really move to the tick? I guess the world will never know. Because there's supposed to be no algorithm. And if there's no algorithm, there's no way anybody could know this stuff. It would have to be random. And they would fall on their face day after day trying to prove something that doesn't exist. But yet, I heard it from a good source. There's a pizza delivery guy that used to work at Domino's Pizza. He can deliver this shit. In 30 minutes or less, guaranteed, or it's free. <laughs> I am having so much fucking fun this year. You have no idea. You think it's Christmas for you. It's like my birthday every day here. Every day, it feels like it's my birthday. I'm celebrating who I am and how I came here. And you get to experience it every single day. And it's fucking fun. It's fun. Because what I'm removing is all of your fear and doubt. And you're getting to see this shit work every single day. Think about it, folks. How fucking amazing is it when we're watching price and I key up your attention to a very specific level? I said, now watch. It's going to move from right there to this level next. And then your chart immediately starts doing that. Doesn't it feel fucking crazy? Like, there's no way. Like, I have to be watching something recorded, and he's hacking my system, and I'm watching something that's already happening. There's no way it could be like this. I, I literally, I'm sitting here laughing with my son. I said, they're probably shitting themselves right now, thinking, how the fuck does he know this? You're right. You're right. How the fuck do I know that? <laughs> how do I know that? Because there's not supposed to be an algorithm, right? So... Why am I making this big, inflated, bloated uh, pitch to you about this? Because if there isn't one, I'm the luckiest motherfucker there's ever been. And I'm going to tell you something. Luck does not exist. That's a figment of your imagination. You make luck. You create it. You manifest it with skill. You either earned it or it was given to you. That's it. They're the only two things because luck doesn't exist. It's like the Easter bunny. It's like fucking Santa Claus. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. But the algorithm, that algorithm is absolutely in existence. It's doing what it's told to do. And for folks that understand, who are they? You're never going to meet them until now. They're never going to talk to you about what it does until now. They're never going to see them be able to do this publicly because they're not allowed to until a language is created.
years from now, many years from now, it's going to be obvious what you're being a part of. You don't see it right now, but years from now, it's going to make perfect sense why all this took place, why I'm talking to you, why I'm teaching it to you. But for now, this year only, keep the attention and focus on you. Focus on learning what it is I'm sharing, the things I'm talking about at that moment. Try, try not to do anything extra. Don't dilute your attention. It's too easy to be distracted with other things that can be learned at a later time that's already on my YouTube channel. The things that you're supposed to be keeping up with right now, I have students that are tweeting to me saying, yeah, I can't watch your live streams right now. I said, yeah, I'm watching the 2016 mentorship core content. Okay, you're failing. You're failing. If you can't watch these live streams right now, you're missing the boat. You're missing it. You're missing the opportunity to watch me do this live. Calling it, explaining it, why it should do this and why it shouldn't do that. Proving to you that there's an algorithm. Proving that there is fingerprints all over this motherfucker. And those lessons that's already on my YouTube channel, you can touch them all the time in the future, anytime. Like tomorrow, I'm not going to be doing anything live. So you can utilize what? You can use that time to go into pre-recorded stuff and study that. Or do your own tape reading, which I would do that personally. All those lessons are never going to come off my YouTube channel. I'm not going to delete anything. There's no reason for you to be afraid of me taking anything down. I want it there. Because I want everybody to know that everyone that has taken my shit and copied it and rebranded it and never gave any credit to where they learned it from because they wanted to be a hot shot. But they can't do what you see me doing. If they are teaching you, you ask them to do what I'm doing right fucking now. And it's going to be crickets. It's going to be, uh, you're out of here, I'm not talking to you, because you're going to expose them. And I am out here, I'm literally out here, standing naked in front of you with no safety net, live, in a medium that I can't retract. Once the tweets go out, boom, it's over. I don't delete one tweet. It's right or wrong. How much time do you see it being right? How often am I incorrect? How many times do you see it going right to the same tick of the level I'm calling for? And then turning on a dime. How often does it react with speed and magnitude exactly when I'm calling for it to do so? When I'm dog whistling and saying, okay, it's time. Run, let's go. That's ownership. That's fucking authorship. That's knowing the shit like the back of your hand. I envy you. You're talking to the source. I'm it. I'm him. But I envy you. Because you're many of you are walking into this so early in your learning and you have this advantage you have this and i saw a tweet by a young man he said hey um is it beneficial for me to learn retail stuff before learning this is there any advantage to that i believe it is taught to you in the perspective that is best to digest it, which is I'm introducing a familiarity to it without you falling victim to it and then or falling in love with thinking that you are going to be sustained by it and then finding out that it doesn't deliver over time like you would hope because you're learning how to do that when it's already flawed logic. It doesn't, doesn't have any bearing on what makes the markets go up or down. It's just a catalyst. It's a thing that causes a trader to take a trade, much like flipping a quarter, heads buy, tails sell. You know, last time my elbow ached, you know, the stock market crashed. So, you know, that type of thing. It, it's trivial, 
and really kind of silly when you think about what most people do for trading signals. What causes them to get into their trades? And the way they make it, like I don't make things complicated. I'm just explaining to you in a language that allows me to talk openly with this language that is nowhere near anything else. And it does sound complicated when I first start bringing out something because you've never seen this before. Try learning Chinese or, or Greek. Those two languages are the most dense language and, and, or Arabic. Mishmaul. <laughs> like what? It, it, that stuff is complicated. There's so many things to learn and know. And the first time you're introduced to that is what? This is complicated. This is really complicated. And you're intimidated by it. And it's easy to run back to what? What seems easy. What students you went to school with? They went through all the rudimentary classes. They never did anything advanced. No advanced sciences, no advanced maths. No additional foreign languages. And they come out in the world, they're the grunts. They're the people that do what we need every day. They're the firemen. They're the mechanics. They're the truck drivers. They're the delivery people. Then you have the other people that say, I want to go as far as my brain will allow me. I'm going to learn everything in school and press and press and press and expand my understanding and learn foreign languages and learn advanced sciences and advanced maths. So I understand when I'm teaching this, there are going to be people that come to me and say, this is bullshit. This is too complicated. This is too, this is too much. He's adding, he's complicating everything. No, you're that person in school that just wants to take the easy way through. And I got it, no problem. Go out there and do what it is that you do to live a mundane life. Get your white picket fence, your single family house, mortgage for 30 years, borrow against the equity every time you increase and just live on credit card debt. Go for it, that's what everybody's doing. I'm just not wrapped that way. And I don't want my students doing that shit. Because that's not success. That's not living. That's slaving. But they call that the American dream here. Mortgage means fucking death note. 30 years to pay what? Almost three times for a fucking house? <laughs> that's the American dream. What, what, what? You don't want that? You don't want that? Who doesn't want that? I don't want that. My home's paid for. You want to be able to pay your shit off too. You don't want to be in a mortgage. You don't want car notes. You don't want debt. That shit is like a millstone around your neck. And learning this skill set is one step forward to not living under that oppression. It won't happen overnight, and it won't happen for all of you. Some of you, you might get real close to it, and because of your own character flaws, your own weaknesses, your own lack of discipline, you won't be successful with this. And guess what that doesn't do? It doesn't change the effect of this. Of this. It doesn't mean that it's fraud. It doesn't mean it's a scam. It doesn't mean that everybody else out there that's making money was lucky because luck doesn't fucking exist. So it's a matter of perception. You look at price through the lens of whatever you've been introduced to accept as this is what it is. When you read these books and these retail logic, they say that price is random. It's a random walk forward discovery of price. The fuck it is. It is absolutely scripted. When I was a younger man, I watched wrestling. Okay, when I was a kid. I loved it. Until I was in like my 16, 17 year, and obviously, you know, I outgrew it. But when I was a younger kid and I discovered that it was scripted and when all the wrestlers would come into town and there was a restaurant down there that everybody knew when wrestling came to our town, they would all go there and eat and you would have a chance to see them, meet them, see them out of character, drunk. 
sometimes hopped up on cocaine and shit, but you could meet them and talk to them. And sometimes they would be drunk and they would talk about the shit that you're not supposed to talk about. You know, when we had that match, remember, you know, you were, you were supposed to do this and you were supposed to, and you're like, what the hell? And when you discover that all that stuff is fake, it's all scripted. They're all partners and buddies. They work together to give you a storyline. That's what you have done as a retail trader. You have believed a bunch of horseshit. But these other people out there that are selling stuff based on that same horseshit will tell you that I'm giving you a load of bullshit. I'm literally out here proving it every fucking day. Proof. Every day, evidence, absolutely undeniable. They're bringing blown accounts, max lost days, shit that doesn't work, nonsense fucking logic that has absolutely no bearing on what makes the market go up and down. Do you want to risk? Do you want to risk real money that you worked your ass off for at a place that you didn't want to fucking be at, that didn't pay you enough for the time and energy you put into it, Working among, among people like fucking Carl. That shit. You want to risk all of your money. On shit. That's contrived and made up. Because that's exactly what bull flags. Head and shoulders patterns. Wedges. Harmonic patterns. Elliott wave. Supply and demand. Volume profile. VSA. Name it. It's all bullshit. When you win, you just happen to be on side. Of what? The script for that day. How, how do we know what the script is? That's what I'm teaching you this year. But before I can break down those lessons, I have to prove it exists. And that's what I've been doing. Proving it. That's foresight. That's understanding. This is how you know what it's going to do beforehand. You've handled it before. You know how it's coded. You know how the source code is there, what it's going to refer to, why it's going to do certain things in reference to other points in the past to deliver something that you won't recognize real time, but it looks perfect and understandable in hindsight. That's what keeps you trapped as a retail trader because they're going to show you the same horseshit in these books, think about it. When you first learned divergence and you know, momentum indicators like stochastic and MACD, it felt like you, you cracked the code, didn't it? That's exactly how it felt for me. I'm like, oh, shit. Every time these lines do that, price goes down. Oh, now I understand short selling. And then I do it and I lost my ass. It screamed higher. Because I wasn't looking at what the market was doing. What was price really doing? It's going to go higher. It still has shit to do higher up. But because these indicators are only taking the data over a period of time that's defined and limited to the number of look back periods, which is like, for instance, if you're looking at the RSI and your setting is 14, you're, you're looking at 14 periods, whatever the time frame is, you're utilizing 14 candles and you're doing the math and compressing the math and you're torturing the data over 14 candles of whatever time frame you're looking at and if you manipulate and torture the data long enough it's going to submit to anything when's the last time 14 candles has the influence over price at any given time where where's the logic in that you just basically pulled it out of your ass is what you did there's literally no logic behind that at all. You're torturing math. And you're subscribing to and creating a cult-like religion, which is what retail is. But all of them out there selling shit, they'll say, I'm a cult leader, and you are all part of my cult. And we are a cult of fucking winning. We're the cult of precision. We're the cult of knowing that we fucking know what we're doing. Okay? So if that's a cult... Sign me the fuck up. Let me renew my membership right now. I want to be a fucking charter member of that fucking shit because around here, we like winning. We like knowing what the fuck's going to happen. I don't like surprises. 
I don't like surprise birthday parties. I don't like surprise fucking hi, how you doing? We didn't we didn't expect to see you. We're showing up unannounced. I don't like that kind of shit. I don't like that kind of stuff. I like planned things. I like to have things scheduled, expecting things, knowing that this is the way things work. I'm a person that likes my shit the way I like it. And that's how I want my trading to be. I didn't see that in retail stuff. And I tried everything. And when you step out of that stuff and you look at price through the lens, I'm showing you to view it through. Everything becomes crystal fucking clear. And it's scary what you believed before. I have I have financial professionals that when they first heard me, and this is, this, this is no truth of what he's saying. And I just calmly told them, just spend some time with it. And tell me six months from now what you really think. Floor traders. Yeah. Bank traders. Brokers. Big names in this industry that I won't drop. They're all convinced that there's something different with this guy named ICT. And what's different is I got the truth. I got tomorrow's headlines. I got tomorrow's lottery fucking numbers and I'm proving it day after day after day. And I'm proving it also that it's transferable knowledge that my students can do the same fucking shit. Look at these young men and women. They're pulling down big fucking money. Big fucking money. Hundreds of thousands of real dollars. You can laugh and talk about these funded account companies and bullshit. And you can talk all this shit. You're not really trading with the account that size. It's not really happening. You're not really putting your trades in the market, blah, blah, blah. Listen, while they can and while you can, fleece the fuck out of those companies. Because they're not going to exist forever. It's not going to happen. But you don't need that. Because if you learn how to do this skill set, trust me. Not that you should be doing it with friends and family, but listen, when push comes to shove, if there is no funded account companies out there, I had whole families coming in on one mentorship. The $155 a month, 25 people ganged up on that one mentorship. They made it happen. It, wasn't, it was outside the rules, <laughs> but they made it happen. The same thing happens here. If you acquire this skill set, how many friends do you have that you love like a brother or sister? You might not have $10,000. You might not have $5,000 for Forex or something to that effect. But if you have a couple of friends that says, look, let me show you what I do. I don't have that much money to provide, but I have this skill set. Let me prove it to you for six months. Let them see it. Let them test drive it. They see that and what's available in terms of money making, they're going to throw fucking money at you. They're going to fucking do it. You can take yourself on the internet and sign up with scouting firms that will literally put you in front of people that have real money. And they will invest in you through a limited partnership. And it's a real partnership. It's, there's contracts. They can't stiff you. And you're, you're held to standards that you, you, you're, you're a partner with them. That shit goes on all the time. All the time. There's other ways that you can do it that I'm not going to talk about here because it's really technically not supposed to be done that way. But when there's a will, there's a way. And there's times coming soon that... If I didn't have it and I had this skill set, and believe me, <laughs> let me ask you a question. Knowing what you see me do, call out in advance and show my executions. If I said, listen, I'm going to open up a small circle of private investors before I even say anything else. Let me stop right here. This is not going to happen. I'm just saying hypothetically. But because I have shown you years of this, skill and foresight and calling it beforehand to levels of precision that you know is undeniable. If I was to say, hey, look, I'm going to take 50 investors, 50 investors, and y'all have to come in with $25,000. 
you, some of you listening would be like, oh shit, I can't do it. I don't have it. I don't have the scratch. But I'm going to tell you something other people in here listening that don't have it themselves. They'll talk to everybody else, put their asses in front of the videos and the things that I'm calling on Twitter, and they will find twenty five fucking thousand dollars. All 50 of them. I'll probably have 600, 600 or more in the first five minutes because they know what they know when they see it. The real thing, the real McCoy, when they're seeing it in front of them, listen, money talks, bullshit walks. You get this skill, people will throw money at you. I'm constantly, constantly asked to do things for money, to coach privately for money, to go into firms to counsel for money, go on teaching circuits for money. And I say the same thing all the time. I'm not interested, but thank you so much. I'm not interested in that. But for some of you, that might be your meal ticket. You don't have to trade with real money with this skill set. What separates you, okay, from the rest? Well, what is the rest of everyone doing? Most of everything you see out there is market replay. Let me teach you. This is the trade. And you listen to these guys. And they'll say, oh, yeah, I, I took a trade here. I don't, I don't know where my fill was. I, I, think I, I think I got in here. Let me tell you something. If you took a trade, you know where you got in. That's that's bullshit red alert right there. If they can't show you their executions and they're talking about, yeah, I think I got in right here. Bullshit. Let me show you my MT4 page of listed results. That's all faked. If they're not executing, explaining why they're doing it beforehand in front of you, it's fake. I'm doing it better. I'm telling you when it's going to happen, where it's going to happen in your chart, calling it beforehand. Now, what happens when you learn this year what I'm teaching you to do and you're willing to do what I'm not willing to do, which is sit out there and provide a service by trading it in front of the whole world? And yes, it can be demo. Because if you're sitting out there with a demo account and you're calling every fucking move every single day, better than anybody else out there willing to do it. And you do that for three, four, maybe six months. And you tell them up front, I'm doing this for free for six months. You're all welcome to come here, criticize me, cheer me on. I don't give a shit. I'm doing this because I'm showing the whole world in six months, I want $250 a month. You will be flooded with people throwing you, throwing you $250. They're, they're going to throw it at you. And all you did was trade the demo account. You're going to give a, a, a medium for people to watch you trade a demo account, but they don't give a fuck that it's a demo. Just like you don't give a fuck that I'm teaching in a paper trading account. Some of you had an issue before, but then now you started seeing, oh, there's something different here. Yeah. If you just would have listened years ago when I first started talking, you would have skipped through all the bullshit. Where would you be then? Now, you'd be so much more advanced in your understanding. The skill, once you acquire it, I'm interested to see what you do with it. I can't wait. I can't fucking wait to see what some of you do. Some of you have no idea how far you're going to go. And I'm excited to see it. Like, I'm here for that. I want to see that shit. Because some of you are absolute dynamos without even knowing it yet. You just need to know what to do, when to do it. And get out of your own way. And once that happens... Magic unfolds. And I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to find that right person that has absolutely stone cold killer discipline, impeccable risk management skills, and learn how to do what I'm teaching to do in these markets precisely. Man. And then to do that confidently and not worry about people copying them, not worrying about becoming a, a a ripoff of what you're doing. See, I, that, that kind of shit gets in my crawl. I don't like that. I deny a lot of what you want me to do because it pisses me off knowing that I had so many people ripping me off even before I went and started trading, not trading, but uh, doing mentorships for, for fee, for you know teaching for money. 
In 2016, when I did that, I broke every rule that I had ever stood by saying, you know, I'm going to do it for free. I'm going to do it for free. And when I saw other people taking my shit and selling it for money, I was enraged. I, the whole world was my, my enemy now. That's how I looked at it because I'm obsessively compulsive. I have a mental disorder where I'm, I'm bipolar. I, I, I'm fucking hide it. Okay. I have real issues and I wrestle with it. So I went to the extreme. That's how it is from one extreme to the next. The best when it's happiest and rage. And very rarely is there ever a balance point in the middle. So I don't want to go out there and put these goobers that don't fucking deserve the clout that they would get by sitting in front of their circle of people that don't know who I am. And they're going to pair it and do exactly what I'm doing. And I'm sure some of them are doing it right now. Mimicking whatever I say in my tweets. That's why I'm doing the women chart. <laughs> the fact that you have to see the tweet, read it, go to your chart, find what it is. You have no time to copy that and you know, repackage it in your own tweet to make your followers look like you're smart. Think about it. Everything I do is calculated. Everything. And also for the doubters, I only got one minute to make the decision about what it's going to do. Yes. It looks easy. You see these guys on Twitter say, oh, it's so easy. I can do it. And they don't. They can't. I'd love to see them do it. Nobody's done it yet. And nobody will until the end of this year because I'm going to create all kinds of little ICTs, little savages that can go out there and slice and dice. And you'll be able to go in here and strip these markets down, know exactly when to do something and when to stay away. And you're going to be enjoying when you see everybody else out there trying to break themselves, trading in an environment that is not conducive for success. And you're sitting back chill knowing that you shouldn't be doing it. And it's amusing, yes. It's sad in other in instances where you know, I, there's a lot of people out there that are failing on YouTube. And I've quietly said, listen, why don't you just try this? And don't even mention my name. It's not about that. Just try this. And sometimes they're just, no, I'm not interested. I want to keep doing what I'm doing. And they're not making money. They're not successful. They're failing and floundering. And I like their personality. I like who they are as a person from what I can see of them. And I'm trying to cultivate more of what I like to see in these YouTubers. But I'm going to provide the real skill. And I'm hoping I'm going to find a match with a like a trades by Matt, like a Patrick Whelan, like a Corbs, Aaron Corbs. You know, I, I want to see personalities that I like, that I have an affinity for. I want them to learn how to do what it is I'm teaching. Not because I want them to rep me. I don't want them to talk about me. I don't even want them to even mention me. You know, it's not about that. I want to see other people do well. I love that. I love it. I, it's, it's to me a great deal of in, in inspiration because it, I live vicariously through those experiences because I have a lot of bad experiences when I was younger. And that's why I envy you. I envy every single one of you because you have the advantages that I did not have. You have the advantages and proof being laid in your hands when I had no proof that none of this shit was ever going to work for me. I just bought it hook, line, and sinker and then lost money doing it. See, you have a perfect laboratory experiment. I said, I'm going to walk in front of you, tell you where it's going to go, point out everything before it happens. Who ever have you ever seen do that? My whole entire reputation is on the line by me saying, I'm going to come out here and call every minute candle and tell you what's going to happen, why it's going to happen. And then if it doesn't happen, holy shit, this guy is a faking fraud. He couldn't even do it. But what are you experiencing? Ever since I started this, every single fucking experiment walking forward. I guarantee you, it's mind-numbing that this is possible. It shouldn't be possible, right? 
Because if the markets are random, nobody should be this fucking lucky. And that's what I wanted you to determine on your own. I wanted that epiphany to happen by you going into the charts doing this. And for the students that have put their work into this, and they're usually the ones that are the most quiet. They're out there making money, man. Like I, I have students that are kicking the fucking shit at these markets. And they don't give a fuck if, the, if you know them. They don't care. They don't care if you think I'm a, a fucking scammer, a fraudster. They don't care that you know that I'm teaching in a demo. They're fucking carving out their own fucking life right now. They don't give two shits. Because they know what they have learned is making them money. And they ain't got time for the bullshit. They ain't got time for drama. They don't care about people's opinion about who, me, nothing. They don't give a shit who's trading another approach. They're just killing it. But some of my students just want to be that soldier that wants to go out there and say, you know what, fuck you. You've talked about smart money concepts. You've talked about ICT. You've talked about you know the concepts. Talked about the students base. And they want to go out there and slap these assholes around and make them look stupid. It, it, you're not going to have any effect on them. They're miserable pieces of shit. You're never going to, you're not going to convince them anything. They're already miserable. So if that's a motivation for you, it's misguided. Just be you. Just do you. And if it's on social media that you claim to you know, strive to do well and, and make a name for yourself, do it on the basis of being able to do something that nobody else is doing. I'm laying a, a wonderful opportunity for a large number of you. Once you know how to do this, if you sit out there and you call this shit live and you push the button in front of everybody and they see you doing it over and over and over and over and you're just calm, cool, collective, it's business as usual, baby. I get stopped out. No problem. I got something else to get me in there. Oh, I took a loss today. I don't like taking anything else. I'm going to come back tomorrow and you get it back and you make more. It doesn't feel like that's possible right now for some of you. Like, man, if I could just get to that point, you'll get to that point. You'll get there. But you got to go through the process that feels arduous. It feels daunting. It feels like you're never going to get through this fucking shit. When is it going to happen for me? When you hear me outline these markets, when you watch me execute and manage these positions, <clears throat> You don't understand how much failure I had early on. You don't know the times that I went to sleep weeping, feeling like I'm never going to get this shit. This is what I got to do the rest of my life. I have to work these menial fucking jobs and a part-time job just to get extra money. I had a skill set. I could code. And I could not land a job with any of that shit. And I was doing it since I was six, in sixth grade. I, that wasn't where I was supposed to be. I can look back now and see it was all perfectly orchestrated where I ended up where I am right now. But I didn't see it then. I felt like there was walls in front of me, just like you think there's walls in front of you. These moments of confusion, these moments of feeling like you're not learning anything yet. You feel like you should know how to do this by now. It's been two weeks. We've been doing live sessions for two weeks. You should know how to trade by now. That's bullshit. That's unrealistic expectations, and you're trying to do too much. That's you're the you're the byproduct of this generation, the last twenty five years, and my own children. I see this because the time that the older ones went through public school. Their expectations on life is a, a little bit skewed. And they pick that up through the shit they learned in school. And my two younger ones who were homeschooled, they don't have those characteristics. What's different? They weren't indoctrinated. My daughter was indoctrinated through all the college bullshit. And it's funny. She sees her dad do this. Well, I'm her stepdad, but I'm still dad, right? She sees me do this. I've outlined something. The model that you had 
given to you last year is hers from me. That's I, I minted that just for her. It's easy. And she doesn't want to do it. Like, as a dad, what the fuck am I supposed to do? I mean, I'm, I'm constantly throwing money at her because she's getting herself in financial trouble. She overspends. She goes into fucking credit card debt. It's, it's constant. never ends. I have family members. I've tried to help. I've given them money. I've put them in homes. I've made things accessible. Vehicles. I've literally given them cars. They wreck them. They lose their house. They don't pay the property taxes on it. And, and they're in trouble and they lose it all. Because they're not financially literate. There are some people you just can't fucking help. And a lot of them might be your friends and might be your family. Which is the reason why I tell you, it sounds cruel, it sounds insensitive, but love your family from a distance while you're learning this. Don't invite them into the conversation about why you're doing this. Because... They won't understand. And the only thing they're going to tell you is you're wasting your time and you're going to lose money and you're going to just believe a pipe dream that's never going to manifest itself and give you the results you're going into this looking for. That's the same shit that my own family members and friends told me. That. They told me that. And they all are still working. In their retirement, they're working. Because they need money. And if I would have listened to the bad advice from people that aren't doing anything fucking positive, they're not making any fucking moves in life. They're working a fucking dead end job at Sears, which, you know, does Sears even exist anymore? <laughs> I don't even know if it exists anymore. No, not Sears, Wards, Montgomery Wards. My uncle and my aunt, they worked at Montgomery Wards. And, uh, they were, you know, trying to be the typical uncle and aunt. You know, they try to give you life advice and shit. <laughs> but the, the the advice they gave was basically just do what we do. And I didn't want to do what they did. They went to work. They came home. They bitched about having to go to work. Went to bed, got up and did the same thing. And on the weekends, they bitched about how they got to go to work on one day. I don't want to fucking do that. Who the fuck wants to do that? Family functions, that's what they bitched about. So you don't want to be around it. You feel like you're around vampires. You go there, you're young, you're full of energy, you're, you're pursuing a, an adventure and bettering yourself, and you want to share it with them, and you tell it to them, and they suck the fucking life force out of you. Oh, that's not going to work. Oh, you know what's going to happen. You're going to try to do this and do that. Oh, yeah, I know so so many people that try to do this and do that. They lost their ass. You're going to be just like them. Don't do that. Just just, just, just get yourself a good job and you know, and, and don't don't try to buy anything too expensive because it ain't worth it. You know, there's no reason why you have, have, have debt. Oh. If I would have believed that shit, where the hell would I be? Who the hell knows where I'd be? But when I heard that, it was like in one ear, out the other. I said, these motherfuckers are family. I'm going to let them talk their shit, but I ain't listening to this shit no more. And eventually, I stopped coming around them. I loved them from a distance. I didn't let them fuck up my fucking plan. I didn't let them in the conversation. Because every time I did, it was always negative. It was always talking it down. It was always trying to make me doubt myself. When I needed to cheerlead my own self because nobody else was around me doing it. I didn't have an ICT. I didn't have a community where I can get encouragement from watching other people do what it is I'm doing or learning to do. I was by my fucking self. Talking to myself. Reasoning with myself. And many times fucking crying. Frustrated. Because it's one thing to be frustrated. Because it's, it's just hard and you put a lot of effort into it. But when you're chemically imbalanced and you think sometimes with unrealistic expectations, which is many times what bipolarism brings, like it, you, you can't even imagine it. Like you can't. You can't fucking imagine how hard it is. But when you feel like you know you're going to be able to do this and you're putting a lot of effort into it, and when you get a small 
small victory and a, a, a milestone in your understanding. And you want to share it because it means it's real now. You didn't imagine it. You go to a family member, you go to a friend and you say, look, look what I just did over here. Look at, check this out. And how they're going to perceive this is this. Oh, you're, you're trying to be better than me. You think you're smarter than me. You know, you're not better than me. You're, you're not more special than me. And what do you think you're, this is going to mean that you're, you know, you're, you're a smarter person and you're going to have more money than me. That's how they're going to internalize it. And their response is going to be, mm -hmm. And that's not what you're looking for. What are you looking for? You're looking for, damn, that's fucking awesome. That's fucking cool as shit. Let me know what you do the next time. I want to know. Or let me do what you're doing. Can you teach me what you're doing so I can get involved? That's what you're really wanting, but that's never going to happen. That's not what's going to happen. So don't invite them in the fucking conversation. You're in Fight Club. The first rule of Fight Club, we don't talk about Fight Club. You're going to get black eyes. Your friends and family are going to be, you know, what's wrong with you? They're going, to sell, they're going to know something happened. You went through a rough period of learning. You just fell down the steps. You caught up volleyball to the eye and elbow. You're playing ball with your boys, caught an elbow. There's going to be times when you go through this year with me, you're going to be worn out. It's going to feel like, man, that was a rough week. And I'm not sure what I learned. Two months later, you're going to know what you learned that week. But you're going to be battered and bruised with the level of observation, journaling, studying, watching videos until you're fucking falling asleep while they're on. It's like college. You're cramming a PhD level education inside of less than a year. But the benefits far outweigh not having done it. And you can write your own check with this skill set. Whatever you want to do with this, once you know how to do it, and that's, that's a big chasm between knowing how to do it and starting here and trying to do it. A lot of you aren't going to get there. You're going to quit. You're going to do other shit or put it aside for a little while. And then later on, when the shit in your life is too much, you're going to be like, you know what? I'm going to go get, I'm going to go back to that and start again. I have students that make money right now that came to me as a paid student, left, quit, tried to do some other bullshit, lost there and said, you know what? I got to go back one more time and came back with the mindset that was proper. I understood that it was going to be hard. And now if you listen to them, they'd be like this. The, the feeling of going into this, wanting it to be easy, is what is the problem. You want it to be easy. And I don't care who you learn from, any, any kind of retail bullshit. As soon as you add money to it, it's hard. What makes it hard? See, you hear people talk about this, and they're going to try to convince you that because I'm teaching you with a paper trading account. Oh, he can't do it with a live account. I did it with a live account. It's on my YouTube channel. I showed you every day. I logged into the account, showed you every fucking statement from every single day. Losing trades, winning trades, over 100%, five weeks, one contract. I don't need to do years of this bullshit. I don't need to do what I'm doing now, and I'm still doing this. Proven. No matter what I do, there's going to be people saying, you didn't do this. You didn't do this. Well, why can't I ask that of them? Why don't you show me what you failed at? Because you're bringing nothing to the table with success. You're just talking shit. But when you're looking at a demo account, and you're, you're, you're utilizing a demo account, you're free to absorb all of the learning and understanding what this market's doing, why it's going up, why it's going down, where is it going to stop? And as soon as you bring in money, everybody's right that has an issue with 
the one element about demo or paper trading, it's not the same internally when you start trading with live funds. That is true. But trading is the same, whether it's in a live or demo. That is the same. So they're taking their own experience because they did what with their demo account? They know by experience. They over leveraged. They kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And eventually they got a winning trade. And they ignore all the shit they did wrong. They reset their accounts. All that bullshit. And they only focus on what? The things that made them feel good. The things that gave them that dopamine hit. If I would have did that with real money, I could have made enough to buy a new car in one trade. Not realizing that you were in a trade with no stop loss. It was drawn down $30,000. And you came back to the demo account because it's been running without you for two weeks. And you come back, oh, look at this. I'm up on this trade. Let me go show that on social media. You know exactly who the fuck you are. You do that shit. And because you got a dopamine hit from that response on, on social media, <gasps> wow, he knows how to trade. You don't know how to fucking trade. You just happen to leave something on that finally made its way to a level where it shows profitability. When you get out there working with a demo account properly, you're learning to follow rules. You're not learning how the market platform works with just a demo. No, no, no. You are learning how to read price action and then how you're going to look for a setup that you're going to go to as this is your model. This is what you're looking for. Each time you go into the marketplace looking for a trade, you're not rediscovering what it is you're going to do. You're looking for that very thing that you go, you go into and you're going to do as a trade entry. What frames the risk on it? It, it, it will always be the same. That's why I told my son, that's why I teach you. You have to use a stop loss that's no larger than five handles. For some of you, it's like, what the hell? I can't do that. You can. You have to go in looking for it. That means you're going to have to be on lower time frames. And you can do very, very well with one contract. One contract is easy to manage. You're all trying to do these funded accounts. In a demo, you're trading like a wizard because you don't care about the outcome. You don't care. Well, there's the problem with why demo to live is a hardship. Because you care about the profit coming and you care about the losing trade coming. You care. You have rushed into trading with live money. You are aware, you're conscious of the fact that you're in debt, that you don't make enough money. And you are conscious that you are impatiently driving very hard and fast to get more money in your hands because you think you're going to trade your way out of insignificance, mediocrity, and being broke. And you think you're doing it with a $100 FX account. You think you're doing it with a $500 Forex account. You think you're going to do it with $5,000. You're not. You're not. I want you to hear me. You are not. You have to be properly funded. And as soon as you go into live trading, what you're bringing to it, because what I'm teaching works. If you just do this and stick to the rules, it works. Where it is a failure for traders that start with live funds too soon is you are bringing your bullshit to it. You care about the outcome. You care about being right or wrong. You're, you're, you're afraid of being in too early and you're afraid of getting in too late, which causes paralysis. So you're looking at the chart and you're watching and you know it's going into that area. I should be doing it, but let me just watch a little bit more. All right, I, I, it's running now. All right, it's up eight, it's up eight handles now. All right, if, if it just goes down one more, two more handles, then I'll buy it because that means that I'm doing what ICT said. I got to buy when it's going down. Oh, shit, it's not going up. Oh, now I'm up 12. Well, let me fucking get it here because if it's going up 20, at least I'll get eight. <laughs> no wonder stressful. No wonder 
it's stressful with life funds because you're not doing what you were trained to do properly because you didn't learn shit. You rushed through the lessons. You didn't do the things I told you to do. You haven't adopted discipline and patience was not forged at all because you binged watch videos. You listen to these spaces like this and it might entertain you. You like these because I go off the rails sometimes. Sometimes I shout. Sometimes I make you know, very loud, abrupt statements. And that wakes you up. It's not that same boring, mundane voice that drones on in those lectures that puts you to sleep. That's the, the college professor ICT. Here, I'm the drill sergeant. You wake your fuck up. You're not sleeping in, sleeper. Wake up. And I'm going to tell you all about yourself. And you need to know that. Because that's who's fucking it up. It's not me. It's not the concepts. It's not the market. It's you. And you have to figure out how to wrangle all these problems that you're bringing into it, which is the fear of being wrong. The necessity to make a lot of money, which that ain't, and it's not possible. You can't take ignorance and go into these marketplaces and consistently make wealth. It doesn't work that way, but that's what you're doing. And that's what people have an issue with when they see me teaching with a demo. They think because I'm teaching with a demo, therefore I couldn't do this with any other medium. But I'm showing you that I can call this beforehand. I've already shown that I can double an account in a very short span of time with just the smallest increment, which is one contract. And I can do it with lots of losses because I was asked, can you create a situation where there's drawdown? And how would you correct that? I did it. Could you have major drawdown and come back from it? Yeah, sure. Went down 80% intraday and came all the way back up. Just because a question came to me by a student said, could you come back from 80% drawdown? Yes. And to prove it, I'll go down tomorrow with it and I'll bring it right back up at the close of the day. New equity high. Don't believe me? Go look at the real results first year. It's the series that I show three months of uh, think or swim, real trading, trading the ES, one contract. 25,000 became 50,000, one contract, lots of losing trades, just to prove that you don't need to be fearful of it. Every scenario that my students came to me with, if you had a live account and you did this and do that, how would you do it? That's what you're seeing. What if you're not precise? What, what if you aren't really that uh, good at getting in? What would be reasonable? That's what I was doing. I was doing close proximity entries. That means what you see my son Cameron doing this morning. Fumbling around, making excuses for not pushing when he's supposed to. Being distracted by girlfriend. By being distracted by, he has to be at work. And all those factors is exactly what you're bringing in. And all of that is going to have your attention diluted. And you can't allow that if you're trading with real money. That's why demo is easy. Because before you even push the button, you already came to the conclusion that I don't care what happens. But I'm interested to see if it works. Well, if you learn the proper way how I'm teaching you without any money through the entirety of this year, no money transactions, no money trades, not even a demo until you're prompted. Once we get into the stage of demo, you'll be pushing buttons, but we have to go through this boring part first. But once you understand what it is you're doing, the same logic that you have when you use a demo where you don't care about the outcome, but you're interested in seeing the results, that's unemotional. You're engaged because you want to see the scientific response to you doing this. Well, when you have impeccable mon uh, money management, your accuracy is right on point. And because you've seen it so many times, you're desensitized. You're not surprised. See, that's the problem when you're trading with live funds. When you're trading with live funds, most of the time you're learning shit that doesn't work anyway.
So right away, you have reason to be worrying. Your asshole's puckering because you know this shit isn't probably going to work. Because it's based on flawed language and logic that doesn't really exist in why the markets go up and down. Moving average crossovers and all the horseshit and trend lines. That doesn't make the market go up and down. So when you go in and you're trading with real money, it's not a stretch to understand why you're scared and you impulsively trade stupidly. You wait too long because you want to have confirmation or you're impatient because you want to make money and you think that that's a signal because somebody on the internet showed you a video, a PDF, some horse shit, and they said, I made this kind of money trading this pattern and you're in a hurry to do the same thing. And if not more, and you're over leveraging your account, that's already underfunded anyway. So of course it's going to feel different. It's going to feel different. And you see these folks out here and listen, I'm not knocking any of you. Okay. Not to hurt your feelings, not to push too hard, not to say I'm better or smarter than you, but, if you're listening, and I'm quite certain some of you are, you're using these funded accounts and you're pressing with five contracts, six contracts, eight contracts, and you're very uncomfortable holding those trades, but you're streaming and I got respect for that. And you're giving and taking. You're taking wins and you feel like you ran a marathon. That's what I find engaging in these live streamers. You can see their face. You can read their emotions. You can see the frustrations as much as they're trying to hide it. Watch their body language. Watch how their breathing accelerates. Watch their agitated stance and how they're shifting in their seats and moving around. And watch the eye contact. When they break contact from the charts, they're blocking out something they don't want to see, a movement against their trade or a movement after they got out. That's the real things that go on in trading. You know what corrects all that? Trading with one contract. What? Mm -hmm. Trading with one contract. Cameron's newbie experience this morning literally had one third of what is expected to be made on any given week to do the, the funded challenge, you know, what do you got to do to pass or whatever. And with one contract. And while he's a complete noob and he's more emotionally attached to my approval or lack thereof of what he's trying to do. I'm a, I'm proud of him for wanting to do this. If he fails for two years before he finds it, I'm still proud as shit. Like I'm, I'm, I won't let him fail. I won't let him fail. But even him coming into this, he has no idea what he's doing. But he's seen that one contract was different from seeing 10 contracts and 15 contracts. He was physically anxious last Friday just watching that 15 contract trade that I was using to fix all his bullshit. He had access to a trial of 150,000 fake trade of eight money to let you see what it's like. And I said, do what you think you should do based on what the chart's doing right now, knowing what you know, which is next to nothing. And he was just pushing the buttons and trying to put this on and put that on different lot sizes, buying and selling right away, doing the opposite direction. If it was moving, he was chasing it. Everything a fucking newbie does. <laughs> okay, Everything. And it drew down to like 135,000. And I told him, I said, okay, okay, stop, 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 stop. Now watch what it looks like when there's real logic behind it. In three trades, boom back up to 151,000 in the same day on Friday. But he was anxious the whole time because he was watching those numbers. And even though it was monopoly money, 
He's anxious to close it. He wants to move his stop loss up. He, like he's flipping the fuck out. Why? Because he has no now stop. Think we both know, and you know that this was a trial version. It's a demo. Nobody could lose money and have any pain from that. But this boy is freaking the fuck out because he's bringing what to it? He's bringing an outcome that must happen favorably or he's not going to have dad's approval. So he wants to do something in my sight, in my presence, watching him. So that way I can tell him, you did good. Good job. He's afraid he's not going to hear that. So everything he's looking at and while he's watching those numbers, he wants to do a good job and close the trade at the highest number when he doesn't know what makes the highest number get to where it will print on the chart. And that's exactly what goes on when people go into live account fund trading or trade with a funded account that got lucky. And I know luck doesn't exist, but circumstances fell into favor and you pass that challenge. So now you have a funded account challenge. Wonderful. What are you going to do with it? How long are you going to hold on to it? Because now the real battle begins. Getting it is just, you know, whatever. That's participation. You got a participation award. Are you going to hold on to it? Will you still have it a year later? How much money are you going to withdraw from it? How many withdrawals of withdrawal profits are you going to be able to pull from it? That's the more weightier matters. But when you get into live trading, leaving demo or skipping over demo, not learning what it is that you're looking for in price. See, that's what you are failing to understand. When you see these folks, people out there saying, um, you, you don't know if you're going to be able to make money. I know I'm making money. I don't know where the fuck you're from, but I know. I fucking know. I know. Even though I'm not doing anything tomorrow, I know if I want to sit my ass down in front of these charts tomorrow, I'm pulling out something. That's just the way it is because I know what I'm looking for. Retail traders and everything that comes under the, the guise of a model that works, it's consistent. You don't know. I'll give you an example. You don't know what harmonic patterns are going to form tomorrow at what time. You don't know that. You have to wait for these Fibonacci ratios to, to come together. And then, oh, okay, now I see that. Let me trade that. What differentiates from what I do and all that Mickey Mouse shit? I know there's going to be a fair value gap that forms in the first 45 minutes of trading. I know that I know that I'm going to get a volume imbalance in the first hour. I know that I'm going to have. Four trade setups guaranteed between 9.30 and 11 o'clock in the morning every fucking day. No matter what profile, I'll have that. They're at my disposal anytime I fucking want them. I go in, I'll take them if I want them. I know that I have four trade setups between 1.30 in the afternoon and 4 o'clock. I know every day, every market profile, I know they're there. Whenever I want them, I go in there, I'll fucking pluck them off the vine. They're there waiting for me. That's my fucking food. I know where to find my food. I'm not guessing when my shit's coming. I know where it grows. I know where the vine is. I know where it's planted. And I'm just going to walk my ass in there gingerly and pluck that shit right off the fucking vine. I can do that. And you're going to learn to do that. That's what the distinguishing factors about what it is that I do and what I teach my students. We're not wondering when our next signal is going to come. We know when and how it forms. That is a level of confidence that you cannot fucking understand until you get it. Once you have that, you sound like me. If you start talking about what it is that you do, you'll sound like me. To the neophyte, to someone that's just coming across me, this guy's an egotistical fucking prick. Well, I get it. I understand. But it's because I know what the fuck I'm talking about. And I walk the walk and I talk the talk together. I don't just pull shit out of my ass. I literally tell you what's about to happen and then it happens. You get to experience it. 
You get to weigh me in the balances every fucking day, and I'm delivering and delivering and delivering. I'm better than FedEx. I'm always on time. The shit's always coming like it's supposed to. And that's exactly how you want your trading to be. You want your analysis to be predictable. You don't need to fucking guess if there's going to be a fair value gap that sets up for a run into liquidity. That's the easiest thing. Like literally, think about this for a second. Analysis was to close this earlier whatnot. <laughs> Whatever. I got time. So think about it like this. If you have a clear, obvious level that has relative equal lows or like today where the market went up into that fair value gap on the 60 minute chart. And that was our target. But then looking at the NASDAQ, it failed to make that higher high. And then the market went down below its short term low in the S&P and the NASDAQ and created its imbalances. Don't you know, in, in, in every fiber of your being, don't you understand that that fair value gap right before it runs to a sell side or buy side liquidity. Don't you understand that forms every day? Think about it. That fucking forms in the morning and it forms in the afternoon every fucking day. Every day. And you are sitting here worrying about this shit stopping eventually because so many people are doing it. You don't listen when I tell you that the markets book algorithmically. They're going to these levels regardless of what? Buying and selling pressure. And you're bringing this myopic approach to reasoning what it is I've already told you. The markets are going to gyrate and go to levels based on its algorithm. It's offering that price. It's just like if you were a store owner and you sold shoes. Who sets the price for the shoe? You do. If you want to get rid of the shoes, you mark them down. Who says you can't? Nobody. These Jordans, they cost this much money. Everybody's selling them for this much money. But you got a pair that Jordan himself came in, tried on, said, you know what? I, I'm all right. I'm good. I don't need them. I get them for free. But you have proof that that man put his feet inside there. So now you're going to sell your shoe for what? Whatever the fuck you want to sell it for. $2,000, $5,000, $10,000. I'm sure there's a nut out there that would literally pay whatever because that man placed his foot in that shoe. But who sets the price? You do. It's yours. It's your commodity. It's your storefront. It's your business. You're running your business the way you want to run it. Well, these algorithms, they're coded to take price to a specific price level by a specific time. I don't give a fuck if you believe me. I don't care if you don't believe me. I'm showing you evidence of it every damn day. And you can't find anything else out there. Show me how it's Wyckoff. <laughs> Show me how Wyckoff talked about how it was going to do these things at this time of the day. Sorry. Old Dick didn't know that shit. Sorry. Gan didn't know anything about it. Elliot still waiting on the wave. Because it never came in his direction at that time. And there is no supply and demand unless you're talking about commodities. Buying and selling pressure is a fucking myth. These things are controlled. And the market will offer that price to allow what? Trading to occur at those prices. If a lot of sellers come in. Like th think about it. You watch these. These people say, oh, well, all you got to do is watch the uh, level two data and you'll see ICT's bullshit about an algorithm is all made up. Just watch the level two data. You're watching spoofed orders. You're watching shit that is not going to have any impact at all on a direction of price. You're just going to watch fluctuations. That's it. That's all you're doing. You're watching fluctuations. The delivery, the, the continuity of that price delivery is what I'm talking about. That's the part you don't understand. You have no idea what I'm referring to. And, and as many times as I've said it, you have your fingers in your ear. You're plugging your, your mind up. Like you don't want to listen to it. You've already convinced yourself that this is no way possible. 
And I'm taking it back to the argument. If it's not this, then how am I able to do it? And that's why I tell people, spend a year with me. You're going to see things that makes it undeniable. You'll also see the cycles that come through in the marketplace. You'll see the seasonal, seasonal tendencies. All those factors will build on your understanding and it'll help you fortify the confidence that you need. You're going to need that shit as a trader. But guess what happens? When you see it and you trust it because you've been here so many times before. Moments ago, I said every day, if you understand the concept of liquidity, everybody can say, oh, of course, there's stops below an old low. Of course, there's stops above an old high. Everybody fucking knows that. Yes, yes, I'm sure they do. But they don't understand how to use that as a setup that repeats every fucking day. And that's what I'm teaching you. That's just one setup. All you have to do, write this in your journal right now, okay? For you to quit your fucking job, to quit your job, all you have to do is find something that repeats every day that can yield you five handles. Here's the easiest, most straightforward ICT lecture. Ready? Watch price in the morning between 930 and 11 o'clock. Wait for price to run through a liquidity above or below. Don't even have a bias. You don't care about a bias. I don't need a bias. I teach you because it's better for you to work within a higher time frame directional bias. It's easier to trust and see the setups because as a new student, there's just so many things to consider. Which swing high do you use? Which which dealing range do you use? You know, what order block? What's fair value cap? How do you know when it's going to You can see how fast this compounds and inundates a new student. I understand the frustration, but there's no shortcutting the experience of watching it live, and then you'll find your own model. But if the brass tax was laid down, here it is. This is it. If I was to go back in time and say, okay, I know nothing. I know nothing about optimal trade entry. I know nothing about the model 2022 that I gave you last year. All I would be looking for is... I want to see an obvious run above a high or relative equal highs and then reject that. I want to see an opposing liquidity pull. I want to see it move sharply in that direction. Once it does that, any, any fucking fair value you got, any of them, once that occurs, as soon as it trades into fair value gap, I'm using that. I'm putting a five handle stop loss on it. And I'm waiting for it to rip five handles, half my trades coming off. And then I'm waiting for it to trade in the opposing liquidity. There it is. And in 90 days, I'm quitting my fucking job. That's not me saying you're quitting your job in 90 days. I'm just saying, I know that that repeats knowing what I know right now. If I can go back in time and tell myself, this is the thing that's going to repeat every fucking day. It's, it's literally no effort. It's no effort. None. Zero effort required to do that. But you don't know that it repeats. But now because I told you, you're going to go into your charts and say, oh, shit, that's there too. Yeah. And I have students that trade models very simplistic just like that. You can make a model very, very complex. And that's exactly what I did in my mentorship because I knew people were leaking it. Those models fucking make money. But those models demand a whole lot. They can be coded and automated. So you don't have to really worry about them. But I can also make a very, very simple elementary approach to it. Like I just gave you here and what I presented in detail in 2022's mentorship on my YouTube channel. I can make it very, very simple. But even when it's most simplest delivered, if you don't know the experience behind its development, how often it forms, how you engage it, what is it you're looking for? Just because I say put a stop loss on the trade for five handles, do you know what that means? Where are you going to place your stop? Because you have to know where you're getting in at. 
where are you entering? What's your multiplier? What's the PD array that you're using for the setup every single time you take the trade? If you're going to use the fair value gap, you're going to put your stop, if it's short, you're going to put your stop loss above the candle that makes the fair value gap. If you can't do that with five handles, can you take the trade? Well, that depends. If you can trade it with a micro, you can take the trade. But if it's more than five handles, even with, and then I can't imagine a trade that you can't do at least one micro because that's not even that much money. But a micro is $5 per handle, not 50 like a mini. So what are you risking? You're risking $25. That's not much money at all to most of us. But there are people that I've trained in impoverished nations where $25 is a whole lot. But that repeats every day. And while you might need to learn how to do it with setups that risk $25 to make $25, condition yourself with seeing that pattern that forms every single day. The, the problem that you realize once you know how to trade is that you were told you can't make money with one-to-one -one when you can. That's what high-frequency algorithms are doing all day long. Some of them are doing less than one-to-one. -one. They have a negative. They're trying to make less than what they're risking because their frequency of entry is so high-paced. And the thing that they're utilizing for a catalyst that gets them in the trade and get right back out of it, it repeats so often. It doesn't care. The creators, the coders that utilized it and implemented that logic, they don't care about the... 35 or 40% losing. They don't care because they have that statistical edge of 60% of the high frequency order flow in their favor is going to compensate over time, even on a day by day basis. What happens more frequently? A 30 handle run intraday, one way, or six five handle trades multi-directional. I don't care how big the daily range is. Six five-handle trades is going to happen more frequently than a one pool single run of 30 handles in the same day. Because there's more fluctuations in price than there are sustained 30 handle runs in one direction. One, one directional runs, 30 handles, there isn't a lot of them within the same day. But there is multiple deliveries of five handles up, five handles down, five handles up, five handles down. All of that intraday volatility is what high-frequency trading algorithms capitalize on. Here's what you're being lied to and being told, that the algorithms are causing that to happen, and they're not. They're engaging in that delivery of price. And the disparity between where price was five minutes ago and where it is today, or, or next five minutes, that is what it's capitalizing on. So how many intervals of five minutes occur over the span of a trading session? A lot. And these high-frequency algorithms are constantly plowing through that, harvesting all of these minor fluctuations. And you're out here trying to get 20 pips a day, 50 pips a day. 280 50, you know, pips in an hour. <laughs> it, it's, it's not needed. All you need is something that repeats over and over and over again. I literally had people clowning me saying, oh, you know, you talk, you talk about five handles. Dude, there are fucking algorithms that only take one handle. And they do billions of dollars a year. That's how much they're taking out. Because they're doing transactions and transactions and transactions all fucking day long in multiple markets constantly boom 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 that's just the way they're they're designed to do that they're like the credit card company every time you swipe that card that merchant has to pay that credit card 50 cents per transaction that's the middleman well these algorithms 
are being the middleman for a lot of your trades. They're not the market maker, but they're utilized as what? The counterparty to you. So when they say, oh, there's no liquidity, that's a lie. There's lots of liquidity. There's lots of buying and selling interest out there. But that buying and selling interest is not buying and selling pressure that pushes price up and down. There is a disconnect there. And it's because you're being indoctrinated to believe that these markets are being pushed around because of the buyers and sellers. That's not what's going on. The buying and selling around these price levels is, well, limited to whoever wants to buy and sell at that time. Price is going to be offered continuously higher up if the algorithm is going to be doing a repricing to a, say, uh, an old high, an intraday high. And it's already done its run for the day on the downside. So now it's going to just reprice, keep going higher, 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 higher. You have seen these days before. When I was first starting out, I lost a lot of money fading that. Every time, okay, 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 it's, there's no way it's going to keep going up. It's been going up constantly, slowly, all day long, tick after tick after tick, no retracements. It just keeps going higher, higher, higher. What's going on there? The market's just perfectly balanced with buyers, and they don't want to ever see it retrace, ever. It just constantly just makes a small little incremental move higher, higher, higher. That's an algorithm. That's what's going on. And look at the depth of market and the level two data when those days occur. It looks like any other day. So please, stop with the bullshit. Don't tell me I don't know how to fucking use depth of market ladders or level two data. I, 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 I know that shit, man. I know it. And it has absolutely no fucking bearing on what price is going to do. You're watching a gimmick. That's a red herring. You're watching something and believing that's what's causing the markets to go up and down. That's not what's going on. Sorry to burst your bubble, but that's just the way it is. And the sooner you wake up to that, your perception about price and how these markets book will instantly change. And the things that you're fearful of and concerned over, oh, the market's going to do this or the market's going to do that. No, they're not. They're going to do the same thing they do all the fucking time until there's manual intervention. When somebody says, okay, we need to set this apple cart upside down and upset a whole bunch of bullshit, an unexpected rate announcement. A surprise rate cut or a surprise rate hike, uh, a war event breaks out, a pandemic begins, something that was unexpected, which is referred to many times as a black swan. A black swan event is an event that no one knew when it was exactly going to happen. And it's a surprise and shock to most people. And it's going to send shockwaves through the marketplace. That's a manual intervention. A manual intervention is when the euro and Swissy was depegged and it wrecked people and brokerage firms. Literally instantly wiped out, insolvent. That's manual intervention. That's the risk that you and I incur every single time we speculate in any market. Anytime there could be a massive upheaval in these financial instruments that is either organic or synthetically engineered. Either one can wreck you. Either one is unpredictable. And that risk is the only risk that I really fear. I don't fear doing a trade and getting it wrong and losing money because I know what I look for repeats. So I don't want to be in Forex right now because I'm expecting a black swan event like a Euro and Swissy depegging. When that unfolded, look at the other currencies. A lot of them fucking flipped out still too. But Euro and Swissy being you know depegged, that was nightmarish. Like it was, you you can't survive that. And we're in a climate right now where they're ringing in this year, central bank digital currencies. 
and you crypto traders think you have it all figured out. None of you know what the fuck's about to happen. I don't know. I just know what you think is going to happen ain't happening. These banks run everything. They own every conglomerate that owns every smaller business chain and franchise. Do some research and find out how many companies really own everything and then who owns those companies and then who owns that. It's five families. Five of them. You know a couple of their names. But there's one that nobody talks about and I'm not saying it either. But they're the ones that pull all the strings and they own all of it. And they're the ones that have everything under algorithm. They own the algorithm. They're the ones that tell you, do this, you do that. You don't do this. You come here when I tell you to. Everything is controlled. Everything. Everything that we deal with is controlled. And people are very slow to realize how fast we're moving into a change that is going to be so jarring, so uncomfortable, even for people like me to have money. I'm concerned. I'm not losing fucking sleep over it because it's going to happen regardless. And ultimately, I'm here for whatever length of time I'm here. You know, if the Lord wants to take me now, I'm ready. Instant death, instant glory. I ain't worried about it. But we're all going to go through a period of very uncomfortable conditions. And when these families that are instituting these central bank digital currencies, well, wait a minute now, Michael, we're talking about countries here. Yeah, they're owned. Those leaders, mm -mm. they're all staffed with their own. Their team player is in those positions. And that's why I said, you can get on social media and bitch and complain. You can say you're going to do this and it's wrong for this and stuff. You can't change it. It's the way it is. You're not going to stop it. No 1776 moment is going to prevent it. The QAnon bullshit that I told everybody, it's a psyop. It was all meant to keep you quiet. Go along and trust the plan. The plan was to sit on your ass and do nothing. And they did everything that they did. And they gained so much ground. You don't even realize how much ground they gained. But you'll know. Before then this year, you're going to know. And with these individuals that run and own everything, they control the outcomes of major decisions, and you can read between the lines what I just said there. They literally remove leaders from other countries if they don't go lockstep with what they want them to do. And you think, crypto traders, you think that these little things that just came out of nowhere in recent years that have had meteoric rises and Meteoric crashes. You think. That they're going to let you. Have these toys. As a means of escaping it. You are going to be. Sadly. Surprised. We're all being funneled into this. And you're going to have. No access. To those things. Now, there's always always been a black market. We'll have a black market. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe not. 
They can't touch your digital wallet. They can't touch your digital access. This, that. I've seen so many people hacked. Shit's all gone. Governments have came in and seized their cryptocurrency. Oh, it's in. It's 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 off exchange. It's this. It's you know they can't do anything. Man, look, that's a pipe dream. All the shit that everybody's ever said about crypto, you have bought it, hook, line, and sinker. When I was asked in 2012, a group of guys, they did like an interview with me and they were trying to get me to go into it. And I was like, yeah, I'm not interested. That stuff is what everybody's going to be bitching about in the next 24 months. This shit is the worst fucking thing. Yeah, you're right. Digital currency, crypto, central bank digital currencies, all that shit. We're all going to be bitching about that in 24 months. It's going to be the bane of our existence. The fucking shit that it brings. The pressure. The fucking limitations. The reason to be fearful about what we say, where we go, and what we buy, and what we try to get. Is going to be directly related to that. You're not going to escape it. This whole Bitcoin shit. Bitcoin was created and introduced to allow everybody to warm up to the idea of something other than what is free for us to use right now as cash. You don't see it. Why? Because they've dumbed down your generation. You have no idea what you just went into. And you think, I'm an old guy that don't know what the, what's, going, what's, going, what's going on. My oldest boy told me that shit. <clears throat> He's the one sitting with $20,000 locked up. He can't put his hands on it. But he knew everything. He was trying to tell his dad how it really is. And I told him, I said, it's why I try to warn you about it. You didn't want to listen to me. But sometimes you have to fall and tear your shit up to learn. And thankfully, it's only $20,000. And no, I could write that shit off for him real quick. He needs to feel that. I had to go through that shit. If I paid off, in some of your eyes, you think that's what a dad should do. No, not this. I bought him a truck, $50,000, no problem. Game cash for other things, no problem. I won't. Pay that off. There's a purpose behind him learning from that. Because if I make all of his boo boos go away like that, when I told him not to do it, I'm enabling him. There's nothing between the difference between that and me giving him a heroin addiction and allowing him to continuously do it, enabling it. So you think that this March of central bank digital currencies that no one saw coming in 2012. None of you were talking about that in crypto. You all thought you had the Robin Hood approach to beating the man when what they did was give you something that made you feel like you were empowered. When this country, the United States, was... Uh, being founded and explorations to the West began. They got out there in California and found out there was a lot of gold in certain areas. So some of the shrewdest individuals was wise enough to know, hey, you know what? We need to make it seem like there's this area right here is a good area to, to mine gold. So they opened up shop. What did they do? They sold screens, pans, pickaxes, and small shovels. For what? Of course, to go look for the gold, right? So if there was so much fucking gold, why are they wasting their time selling pickaxes, pans, and screens, and shovels? They should be using that shit to go get their fucking gold. The only people that were making money in the gold rush were the people that were selling the pickaxes, the screens, and the fucking panhandling. 
So when they gave you your cryptocurrency, they were selling you the pickaxes because they thought you were doing what? You thought, rather, you were doing what? Mining Bitcoin. Of course, there's going to be people that find a nugget here and there. Of course, they got to keep that shit hot because the selling of what? The pickaxes, the screens, and the pans for panhandling gold, that's where the people were really making money. So they pacified all of you. They gave you this thought process that you're beating the system. You're going to be able to escape anything bad that comes forward in the future. And they allowed that shit to rise up. Listen. Listen, listen, listen. When my wife asked me if I was trading Bitcoin, and I told everybody, I said, you know, it's going to go up from 10,000 to 20,000. And when it was at 19,700, my wife asked me, do you trade Bitcoin? Now, my wife never talked in terms like that. She's always thought of this as a fucking video game. <laughs> I was literally sitting next to her on the couch. And I remember the day like it was just five minutes ago. I turned to my left and looked at her. And I felt like all the blood just drained out of my body to my feet. Because here's my wife. No idea what the fuck's going on in these markets. And she uttered the word. Bitcoin. If there's one person at the end of the line that's going to be the buyer of any bullshit in the marketplace, that's my wife. She's the last one to know. And when she asked me if I was buying Bitcoin or if I held Bitcoin, that's the top. And I shit you not. I literally, at that moment, I said, news break. <laughs> uh, Bitcoin's not going to 20,000. My wife just asked me if I'm trading Bitcoin. If she's going to ask me that, nobody else is left to buy it. <laughs> it's going down. And I told everybody it's going to 6,000. And I got fucking ripped apart. Everybody was loving me when I said I was going to go to 20. From 10,000, it ripped up there. And at that moment, I said, no, it's not. And guess what it didn't do? It didn't go to 20,000. It went down to 6,000. And then I said it was going to go to 3,000. And I was off by, I think, like 200 points. And then I called. I told you all. I said, I will let you know when it's going to go to 20,000. And then I did. And then I said it's going to go to 30,000 on New Year's. And I was off by a day. And I told you it was going to go to 50,000, 60,000, at the highest, 70. And it's not going to go any higher than that. Look at your Bitcoin chart. If you've been with me for a long time, you know when I was on Twitter, I did that. I had three other calls that were very minor. They were incorrect. But every major move, I called in that bitch, and it was right on point. How did I do that? Looking at why they would let you want it to happen. The work's over now. You want Bitcoin 100000 Not happening. You have real competition coming out, which was the whole intended purpose of allowing all of you to get comfortable with something other than those greenbacks, those dollar dollar bills, y'all. If they would have said, hey, look, we're, we're getting rid of your cash right now. And you have no choices the way it is. That's going to be jarring. They don't want that. So they warmed up the idea of creating something that's allowed. To be used as currency. Since fucking when. Did the United States government. Allow any other currency. But the fucking dollar. We have went to war. Over this fucking piece of shit currency. That we have. And you think. That they're just going to let this. Come out of nowhere. Some mythical fucking being. Satoshi. <laughs> Come on. Are you fucking kidding me? You really believe this shit still? You believe it. Satoshi is so guarded. You're never going to meet him. He's created only so many Bitcoins. And this is the way. Like, what the fuck? And you think I come off of some bullshit. I'm proving my shit. That's Santa Claus. Satoshi's fucking Santa Claus. Nobody's ever fucking seen him. He's bringing gifts that's limitless. 
And what do you have now? Yes, we had a little bit of a movement up in crypto just recently. Who cares? Who gives a shit? They got to keep you happy. They got to keep you happy about the idea that there's still hope. While they roll out the central bank digital currencies, you won't notice what's happening. And then eventually what's going to happen is when that gets started, you're going to start seeing shit happen in crypto. You're not allowed to trade this. This is banned. Brokerage firms are going to be told you can't do this. Oh, but I can trade. You can trade. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can trade right now. You can. You can. Absolutely. You can have your shit on your wallet. Absolutely. But when the governments come down on the brokerage firms and say, we're seizing your fucking shit. They're not letting you trade. That's just the way it is, folks. That's what's coming. When I'm talking about trading being fucked with, that's exactly what I just mentioned is happening. I think the S&P is still going to be trading. That's why I went back to it. Companies are going to do what? Being business. There'll probably be less of them, but those companies will be offering shares and those fluctuations will be moving these markets around with buying and selling interest. Not buying and selling pressure. But crypto, the way you see it right now, where anybody can create a fucking coin, really? You honestly think that that's going to be allowed when they bring out what they are replacing these fiat currencies with? You asked for this shit, and they created the environment so you would want it, and you thought you were winning. Yeah, we're beating the fiat system. No, you're not. They used you. They pimped all of you. They let you believe that you were calling the fucking shots. And what they were doing was putting a yoke on you. Some of you have woke up to it, but most of you haven't. But you're going to in 24 months. In 24 fucking months, you're going to be thinking to yourself, wow, I did not see this coming. Yep. Once they have everybody in a central bank digital currency and there is no cash, and that's exactly where we're going, it's over. That's the last, that's it. You can't, nothing. They own you. 100% they own you. Your money turned off when they want it turned off. You don't do what they want you to do, no problem. They're not going to take you off of social media. They're going to turn your fucking money off. You think you're stressed out now. How much money do you have in your Bitcoin wallets? Your cryptocurrencies? How about when they seize your shit? What are you going to do? Who are you going to complain to? Who's going to defend you from that? Nobody. That's what's coming. You want to know so bad. That's what's coming. And I have not been wrong. I know some of you hear these. And you think to yourself, well, what's the point of trading? What you? It sounds like a, it's a waste to even do this. Now, you should be investing. You should be trying to get whatever you can right now and not buying bullshit with it. You should be buying things that you need for your house. Food that doesn't perish real quick. Canned goods. Lots of it. Water. A couple years ago, when I was on Twitter before they started censoring me, and I said, fuck this, I'm leaving. I mentioned that there was a water futures contract coming up. And I also told everybody when they were introducing the Bitcoin futures contract, I said, when that happens, 
your treasured belief about how they're not manipulating Bitcoin. They can't manipulate Bitcoin. I said, as soon as they put a futures contract on it, that argument's over. And it has been. It's owned. It's manipulated. Period. I don't give a shit what anybody says, but uh, <laughs> the U.S. government created Bitcoin. And I know I just pissed off a lot of you. You're fucking flipping out right now. But they did. Anybody that has simple common sense would know the fact that they would even allow that to be used as legal tender here. Do we, uh, do we use Japanese yen here? When's the last time you went to the grocery store and you gave them uh, loonies? Swiss francs. Um, how about the uh, Deutschmarks? That's one for you. <laughs> Can you go and pay for gas with euro dollars here in the U.S.? They're going to like, what the fuck is this? Get out of here with this. But they somehow, all of a sudden, bent over backwards and let cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, all of a sudden, get in there and have some use. Oh, when you look at it that way, see, you're told that it's finding its way in as a main staple. It's going to be the, the reserve currency of the world. The bullshit. It's never going to be that. That's never going to happen. It was a catalyst. It was the Trojan horse. That's exactly what it is. And it has all of its little things. These other coins, these shit coins, these things that move around. Ripple's going to be, Ripple's a bunch of bullshit. I know that this does not sound fun for dudes that are in crypto. And I'm making you angry right now. And you want to fucking prove me wrong. I guarantee there's 50 fucking comments in my fucking Twitter feed right now. I'm wrong. You're going to be fucking cluelessly laughed at, blah, blah, blah. Watch what's going to happen. But hey, I heard all that bullshit. I heard all that shit when I said it wasn't going to 20,000. It was going to go 6,000. And it did. I told you when I told you it would go up to 20,000. You'd hear it from me. And I told you. I told you the fucking dates. And it delivered. I told you how far it would go, and it stopped. The real fun's about to happen soon. When everybody feels like they can weather the storm because they have a little bit of money, when that doesn't help because you can't buy shit because it ain't there, you're going to wish you listened to me about putting food in your house. About getting things like extra clothes, socks and underwear, the things that people just take for granted right now. Over-the-counter medicines. Advil. Got a headache? Oh, I'll just pop an Advil. It's easy to get Advil. Just got there. Something like that might not be accessible in the next coming months it's hard to articulate <sighs> making something like this that would be so far-fetched but look what we've been dealing with for the last three years Globally. That ground that they gained with all this shit. These control measures, these lengths that they're able to go to now and no one questions it. No one says. This is. Uh, this is overreach. They condition you through pain and discomfort and fear. And we're in an industry right now 
that walks around like we're the cock of the walk, man. We we roll everything. We're the fucking big swinging dicks of the of the world. We're financial giants. We're traders. We're traders, man. We don't need jobs. Let me tell you something. We are going to get fucked with. They are not going to let us feel like we're exempt. So you need to learn this skill set. Make what you can make. Acquire, store up what you can. And fasten your seatbelts because it's going to be a fucking bumpy ride. And I'm not talking about, oh, it's going to be a rough couple months. We're looking at like 10 years of shit that nobody wants to put up with. And they're going to be utilizing a lot of uncomfortable things to try to get your attention away from the shit that they put us all through. And guess what? That's repeated. We're doing the same thing that you didn't learn about because you don't learn history. You don't even see it. You don't even observe what's going on right now is exactly the same playbook they did in 1947. Because you didn't learn history. They don't teach it. But for the old heads, we were taught history. And some of you were old enough to know things that were before my time. But you recognize this shit. And when you try to talk to people around you that are younger, they don't see it. They want to hear it. You're uh, whatever. You're an asshole. You're a racist. You're a. Whatever you want to call it. They're going to come up with a name to, to vilify you. The only thing you're doing is saying. What you know is, is repeating history. Everything that's happening right now were the same catalyst for us to end up in World War I. And you don't see it. You know, the easiest way to forget about all the bullshit with COVID, the vaccinations, the vaccination harm, all the people dying. All the businesses that were put out of fucking business. People that lost their jobs. You know the best way to make all that shit be the least impactful in terms of conversation, talking points of the water cooler? A fucking world war. That's going to be the talk at every dinner table. Everybody's going to be talking about it on social media. Everybody is going to be worrying about that and their children potentially getting drafted and i'm going to say this right now i don't give a fuck none of my children are going anywhere they can suck my fucking dick they're never going to fight for these pieces of shit they're never going to do it i'm never going to allow it and i don't give a fuck last time i saw them they went on a hiking expedition in fucking europe see ya and i don't give a fuck what your thoughts about that is this is the way it is but that's what they're cooking up. You got kids? You got children that are getting ready to graduate? Believe me, they have their eyes on them. And you're going to be worried about that above everything else if they're cast in that meat grinder. And you think your biggest problem right now is worrying about getting stopped out in a trade. You have no idea what's coming. There's things that are outside our control. And not being in a position to prepare and get in a position where you can have the things that you need day by day and have a supply of it. That way, if there is a shock to our supply chain and we can't get medicines clothing, prescription medications, light bulbs, simple shit like that. I mean, you don't think about it, but what happens when you 
lose the ability to turn on the lights in your house. See, you're all used to technology. This thing I'm holding in my hand, talking into, and you're most likely listening to. They've trapped your mind and your attention in this little prison that they've convinced you that you have to have with you at all times. And you're constantly looking at it. It holds your attention constantly. They own you with this fucking thing. Just like I own your attention right now for hours. Why? Because I'm giving you something that's going to turn into a skill set that can make you money. And social media and advertising, they constantly give you hooks to hold your attention. Sex, money, entertainment, dopamine. And they make you think that you need to buy another one because planned obsolation. It's uh, uh, obsolation. It's the phone is programmed and every time they do an update they slowly reduce the ability for the phone to behave like it's supposed to when you first bought it. The battery life doesn't work as long as it did. So what happens? You go out and you spend $1,200, $1,400 for a new phone every two years. That's for the folks that don't want to keep up with the new technology. I don't want another phone after this one. I can't wait for this fucker to stop working, <laughs> to be honest with you. I don't want it. I can't stand it. I don't carry mine with me when I leave my house. This is something I'm worried about leasing and, and dropping, whatever. And when I cared about my phone, I always dropped it and broke it. Screen protectors, fucking otter box cases, all that bullshit. It still would break. I don't give a fuck about this phone and I want it to break and I don't ever drop it. <laughs> it's fucking contrarian. But I'm hopefully getting you to think about how you can prepare your household. I'm not saying be doomsday fucking prepper, okay? Like, you know, <laughs> Mad Max type shit. I don't think that's what we're going to see here. But I do suspect that things are going to get really, really hard and violent. Your neighborhood might be a neighborhood that's nice like mine is. But unfortunately, those neighborhoods are the ones that are raided. And you have to have a whole lot of tools at your disposal to help you prepare for situations like that. In the United States, we have tools for it. Other countries, you may not have that. So you have to you know, prepare. And every country is going to be affected. Every country. It's going to be impacted by every nation. They're going to have this hardship placed on them. Because the whole point is complete and utter submission to what they're rolling out. They. Mm -hmm. They. The world leaders are just employees to them. You're not going to stop them. You're not going to hinder them. The only thing you're going to do is bring trouble to yourself by making a name or a bullseye for yourself. The only thing you should be doing is making your house ready as best you can. That's it. That's all you can do. And if you do well enough to pad your own household out with non-perishable food, things that help your everyday life be maintained should you have a disturbance with being able to get certain things. If a... Well, think about like those folks up in uh, Ohio. That train derailment, the whole episode of you know the shit getting blown up and burnt up and creating a toxic cloud of bullshit, you know, falling down and killing everybody's animals around there, and who knows what health risks these folks are going to have years from now. What happens if that happened in your neighborhood? How would that affect you as a trader if your whole shit got wrecked, and now you're in an area where? Potentially your water supply is tainted. Your animals, if you had livestock, they're dead. That's what's going on up there. Even in Pennsylvania, where that shit drifted over there, it caused all kinds of chaos there. See, 
this new generation thinks that those types of things only happen in movies. Because you walk around with these little four-inch universes of these cell phones that you carry around. And whatever happens, and whatever thing, but anything that you would know about the world has to come through that social media application. Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. My fucking wife is addicted to that TikTok shit. I can't, I have to watch this shit. She shares stuff. Like, I like it. Like, I don't, I don't, I tell her all the time, I don't want to see that shit. Don't send me those links. I get four or five of them a fucking day. I've been talking to you and I got three of them. I ain't opening them up, but they're there. But your perception of the world and everything around you is shaped and molded by these things. And when you hear somebody that is outside of that, it sounds like, oh, well, there's, there's something clearly wrong with that person. Because I'm not of the hive mentality. I'm not a herd member. I'm outside the herd. I'm watching all of you get picked off one at a time. And you don't even see it happening. There's a noose going around all of our necks and it's tightening up every day, tighter and tighter and ever so slowly. And money is not going to fix that. For a short period of time, money is going to permit you to make your house ready. You might need to move if you're in a bad area. If you're in a, a state that has issues, maybe trading would be the catalyst to get you out of that into a more secluded area. Because when everybody else can't purchase food, get food, get gasoline for their vehicles, there's a big thing right now. Everybody's going around cutting catalytic converters off of cars and selling them. What are you going to do when you can't drive your car, buy food, and the electricity is off? When the lights go out, how are you going to be able to conduct your business? How are you going to keep your household going? Do you have a plan for that? Most of you, especially this most recent generation, you don't think that way. You've never had a reason to think that way. All of your TV shows are nonsense. Reality TV, which nothing in about it is reality. It's bullshit. And you keep up with scripted drama that you think is reality. It's a real thing. It's not a real thing. These people are acting. And that shaped your mind, just like it shaped my oldest two kids. And the logic they hold with many of the things in today's world is ass backwards. And it's frustrating dealing with them as a parent because they think they got it all figured out when they don't. And I see them frustrated because they think that they know what it is they should be doing. And when we tell them as their parents, you're, the, you're going to make a mistake doing this. You should do this, 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 and make ready a plan B for that feeling. They, no, no, that's not what we're going to do. And they fail and dad has to bail them out. And it's the byproduct of what you have not been taught. The youth of this generation right now, they have not been conditioned to go out on their own, earn their own keep, be entrepreneurs, be successful entrepreneurs, independent thinkers. They've not been taught that at all, that those skill sets don't exist. Not in this generation, it doesn't. There are exceptions to that, yes. But if, you know, by far and large, predominantly most of them are not capable or functioning adults. They're emotional wrecks. Their whole existence has to do with how they're perceived on social media. 
and they quickly fail and have to come back home and live with their parents. And you don't like to listen to something like this when this is something that you should have learned growing up. You should have heard these types of things in school like we did. When I was in school, they taught us how to do things that run a household. Home ec. How to take care of shit, how to do a checkbook. I was surprised to see my kids never were taught how to do a checkbook in school. They never were taught how to run and manage a bank account. And that's something that's easy and should be taught. It should be rudimentary. It's not. They took it out. And I don't understand why that would have been done, except for to make you stupid. Because if they teach you in school to watch your balance on your bank account, then you're going to be more mindful to do what? Not overspend on stupid fucking phones, stupid clothes that are overpriced, cars that are too much money, image things. See how they conditioned people? You don't see it, but now when you think about it like that, it makes perfect sense. Social media, you think, is a fun thing. But social media is the very reason why you're fucking miserable. Because you don't feel like you're arriving where you want to be at fast enough because you see other people doing things that they don't really do. They're faking it. They don't own those things. They don't really sleep in those places. And those girls they pretend to be with don't really love them or sleep with them. So you're falling victim to an illusion. And then it makes you depressed. And you sit there and you look at it more and more and more. I got to go see what this guy's doing. He's, he's my motivation. No, he's not motivating you. You know what he's doing? He's making you feel like shit. Because you don't have and you won't have the things he's pretending he has. And it's all fake. That's why I am the way I am. I'm boring. I don't flash anything. I stick to what matters most. I tell you I can teach you how to trade. I tell you I can go into the charts and show you what's going to happen beforehand. And I do it. I don't sugarcoat it. It needs to be practical. It needs to be proven. It needs to be believable and evidence given that it works. For some of you young folks, when you see this, you're shocked because none of the shit that you've ever worked with has been this transparent. It's all been a myth because it's all through social media. Social media is social engineering. And you've been engineered to believe more bullshit than any other generation. My wife, I love her to death. But I tell her things, much like I tell you. And I'm usually about a year and a half, two years ahead of everything else that you see. When it goes into the mainstream media and people are start talking about it, I'm 18 months to two years before that. I'm ahead of the curve by two years. And I tell my wife a lot of these things that were coming and all that shit. When I was buying up toilet paper and extra food in October of 2019, when I was tweeting to all of you before, telling you, get your shit together, it's coming. And none of you wanted to listen. And all of a sudden, we weren't allowed to go around anywhere. Couldn't go into restaurants. Couldn't. No businesses were open. You got to have a mask on. Stay six feet away. Be afraid. But when nobody could get their hands on toilet paper, that was like the new gold. I had 300 fucking rolls of that shit. <laughs> and I was giving it away. I had food, water stocked up, over-the-counter medications, everything. I had everything. And when they shut down all the what we would expect to have at any normal wake up and I need something, I'll go out and get it. When you couldn't do that, my wife was flipping out and panicking. 
and I had to take her to our storage areas. And I said, listen, look at this. She said, where the hell this come from? I said, that's what I've been doing. That's what the boys have been doing. We, we go out, we go to the store, we pick the shit up and we store it in here. And there it is. So I was making ready for all this stuff. In August of 2019, I knew what was coming and I was talking about how all these things were going to happen. If everything I was seeing was going to happen, we would know come March of 2020 and, and it hit. And my students that have been with me a long time know I, I said all this publicly. And at that, that time, when I started saying shit, my tweets were censored. So I said, I'm done. Not now I'm on their radar. I'm done. I'm not talking no more. I'm just going to, I'm done. Now, conspiracy theory is fact. <laughs> I mean, everybody, everybody knows about UFOs now, right? They're, they're fucking talking about UFOs every day. Unidentified flying object. We shot down a UFO. Now, if that shit would have happened, if they were talking about that stuff before COVID era, people would have been panicking, freaking out. But all during that shit, they, they slipped that in there. Oh, yeah, by the way, there's real UFOs. I'm not saying there's people up there and you know, UFOs flying around in ETs. I don't believe that. <clears throat> but they're constantly giving us shit to be worrying about. They got something on the menu for everybody to be worrying about. And that's how you know we're in some real shit because they're constantly keeping people panicked just like they did with 9-11. And I was a victim of that shit. Like I, I was fearful of everything. Now I don't give a fuck. If I'm going to die, I'm going to die. I'm not going to worry about it. If I'm going to get a disease and die, I believe it's, you know, it's what's going to happen. The Lord's called me home that way, and there it is. It's done. I'm gonna, I can't fight it. can't beat it if it's what it's going to be. It's going to be that. I'm not going to live my life in fear. And the, the worst thing I can do, knowing that I have these convictions about what I believe is coming, I've been very vocal about it as, as much as I could be, right? Because if you said certain things on social media before, you'd have your account turned off. You know, you're shadow banned and you're blocked and you, you don't have a voice anymore. So I want to keep this voice available. I'll sacrifice my Twitter account. I don't give a fuck. You know, I came here for one reason. To show everybody that they were full of shit and I'm, I'm here. I'm proving it and there's nothing like this. But if they were to shut this down, I ain't losing any sleep over this. I don't give a shit about this. I don't want to upset too much. I don't want to say too many things to you know stand out for all the wrong reasons. But I think it's reasonable now to expect more bullshit coming. It may not be wear a mask, stay six feet apart, but it might be other shit that is even more uncomfortable. When they predict that we're going to have a worse pandemic come 2025, how the fuck would they knew that? Unless it's engineered. I'm going to say it, and you're just going to have to accept it, the fact that this is my opinion. If you want to unfollow after this, it's your business. I don't care. I don't want to debate about it. But I have to say it to get it off my chest because it's that's just the way I am. We're going to see people dying a lot. And we're already seeing it now. The stuff that they put in individuals over the last two years is not good. And more and more information is being brought to light about how bad and toxic that shit was. So when you hear people like Bill Gates say, we're going to have a worse pandemic 
come 2025. You just do the math on that. If you take one dose and it drops your white blood cells and the ability of producing them down by 50%, and you take a second dose and it takes it down another notch like that, your immune system has been wasted. Add to the fact that you now have the ability to create blood clots at a faster pace. It's not hard to understand why these young folks that are otherwise healthy specimens, they're athletes, they're just all of a sudden dying. Of course, people die all the time. But I believe they've cooked up something where as this begun as it begins to manifest itself in a more obvious manner, more people dying. How hard is it for people to see that and hear this box on their wall, which is the television, which I don't watch. I got nine televisions, not my monitors, but I have nine televisions in my home. They're all hooked up to Netflix. They're all hooked up to a gaming system of some kind. Usually it's Xboxes, but I have the PlayStation 4 and I have a PlayStation 5. Yes, I'm a gamer. Yes, I play Call of Duty. Uh, I play Battlefield. Um, and I play Spinner Cell in Resident Evil. That's my games. That's all I play. And no, you're not getting my gamer tags. And no, I'm not going to join your circles and bullshit. I'm not going to do that. But I don't watch television. I don't watch the news. I don't watch any of that bullshit. I read headlines. That's it. I don't need the rest of the, the stuff. I just read the headline. Everything you need to know is in the headline. What they want you to fear, what they want you to be excited about, what they want you to worry about is in the headline. Everything else is bullshit in the articles. So that's all I watch. I, w I read the headlines and that's it. But these, these televisions and the programs they're up, they shape your opinion about everything. TV shows, all the bullshit. And I believe that because, well, let's be honest, you know, Bill Gates is a piece of shit. You know, the guy dropped out of college. He doesn't have a medical medical degree, but he's over there in Africa giving the polio virus to Africans. Come on now. Like this guy is a plague. He, he's a problem. And he's viewed as a philanthropist, like he's some savior. And we, uh, we elevated this guy up to a point at which where we looked to him as a medical mental giant because he funds vaccinations. And now this same person has been releasing Genetically modified fucking mosquitoes, okay? What the hell would you want to do that for? Well, because they're basically flying syringes. So if you want to spread a disease, I'm not saying one is being spread, but if you want to spread one, that's a wonderful instrument to do that. When you see a mosquito... He's on your arm, it's biting you. Oh, it sucks. You smash it. It's it's done. You don't think nothing of it. But this dude had hundreds of thousands of these things released in Florida twice now. He's the same person also that's funding all of the shit that we see that looks like clouds, but they aren't clouds. They, it's like it creates a haze over where you live at. Like here in, in Maryland, they're constantly spraying this shit above us. And you can't see the sun. It's always hazy. And it's this shit that when we have rain collection, uh, rain, rain collection uh, barrels here that you know, you want to have extra rain water in case the shit goes bad. We have well and septic in Maryland. But people like my thought process, we like to have barrels that when it rains, it goes down and we collect it 50 gallon drums and there it is. And you start seeing this shit that wouldn't be there on the days that it's really, really clean, clean sky, not really 
shown too much. There's the white puffy clouds like you did see when we were in the 70s and 80s. But now, all of a sudden, the sky looks different because they're spraying this shit up there that's not good for us. And what we found out is that they're using that to block the sun. The beneficial sunlight that we get from the sun is being blocked by that spraying of that bullshit. And who's paying for it? Bill Gates. And this is the same guy that's been buying up all of the farmland in the United States. He's the largest farmland holder in the United States now. We're f- f- really close to it now. What, what does he want to do that for? He's the same guy that made that uh, fake hamburger bullshit. Impossible meat or some shit. <laughs> Nobody wants to eat that garbage. Genetically modified horse shit. So how many times does one guy need to pop up when there's always a problem with it? And he's the guy that's guaranteeing there's going to be another pandemic that's going to be worse. And people are going to really take notice of this come 2025. Now, my opinion is that the folks that have taken this vaccine, and mind you, my oldest is my daughter. She's taken two doses of the Pfizer against me telling her, please don't do it. But because the TV told her, because her friend said, you know, we have to do this, protect everybody, blah, blah, blah. She did it. Now she has constant fucking nosebleeds. She gets rashes all over her back. We were talking to her today while she was driving home from work and right there on FaceTime with my wife. Boom, like a faucet. She, her nose is bleeding constantly. She didn't have that shit before she took that stuff. So I'm constantly praying that whatever they gave her in that stuff has no effect. But yeah, you know, I, I, I hope I hope I'm wrong. But I think what's going to happen is folks are going to fall victim to that shit that they put in them, and because there was a lot of them that did it. When they start dropping oh, everywhere, athletes, politicians, celebrities, your neighbors, your soccer mom, friend, their children, all of a sudden, just dropping. Look at what they're doing. They put all of these excuses for, you know, Watching, no, playing video games increases the chances of getting a blood clot and having a heart attack. Driving your car more than 14 hours a day or 14 hours a week causes blood clots and potential heart attacks. It's like they're constantly giving you reasons to suspect why people are going to be dropping dead of blood clots and heart attacks. So you're probably asking yourself, how the fuck did we get on this topic? Well, The reason why I'm doing this is because I want you to be prepared to take care of your own when this shit starts coming. Because that's what's on my heart. That's what's on my mind. That's why I want to help you. Because it's going to be hard. It's going to be scary. It's going to be things that are uncomfortable. Science fiction level bullshit. And maybe some of you have had that given to you and you felt like you were doing the right thing by doing it. Maybe your job required you to do it. You can't work here unless you have this. And I have friends that didn't keep their job because they said, no, I'm not taking that. And they had coworkers drop dead after taking it. Do you think they feel bad about not doing it and losing their job? Fuck no. And I'm sure some of you took it. Nothing ever happened to you. You're healthy as a horse and, and great. Wonderful. I believe there was placebos put out there. But, you know, that's my opinion. You don't have to believe it. I'm not saying you should. But that's my belief. And I'm hoping that my daughter had a placebo. But, you know, seeing how she whelps up on her back and her arms and stomach. And she gets chronic nosebleeds now. She's irritable constantly. And none of that stuff happened before her taking that shit. And she, it's not in her head. 
So it's not like a physical manifestation of, oh, she's scared now because, you know, she she knows she took two doses. Of it. No, it's not that at all. She believes that people should get it right now. She's mad at us because we won't do it. I didn't wear a mask. I walked around <laughs> and I literally was around everybody. I never got a dose of that shit. And yes, in January of 2020, before it was obvious everywhere, I lost my ability to smell and taste for like shit two weeks. And I had this weird smell in my, it was almost like a, whatever, if you could imagine what blood and rust, if it had a smell, th that was like what I was trying to explain to my wife. I was like, I can't smell or taste anything, but I have this same constant putrid smell of what would be rust and blood. And it was, sometimes it would feel like it was a sweet odor but sickingly sweet. And then it would get to be, it would just be nasty smelling. And then all of a sudden I woke up one day at 104 degree temperature. I felt like I had been hit by a bus. So I put myself in a nice bath, brought my temperature down to a hundred. And I had to do that for, I don't know, maybe six, seven hours two or three times because it would shoot right back up. My head hurt so freaking bad. I felt like I was going to crack open and I was so fatigued. Once I broke the fever, it was a low grade fever, but I went downstairs, grabbed a bottle of water, chugged it. I wasn't wanting to eat or anything. I didn't feel nauseous, but I was zapped with energy and my head was pounding me. So I said, I'm just going to go up here and lay down. I don't feel well. I went to sleep and I slept for 17 hours. One shot, no medication, no sleep aids, no nothing. I slept for 17 hours. I woke up. My wife was like, are you okay? I said, I don't feel well. I'm thirsty. I said, grab me two bottles of water. She went and got me two bottles of water. I chugged them. I went to the bathroom, relieved myself, laid back down, 15 hours slept. Woke up, head pounding me, drank, didn't eat again, slept eight hours. Woke up after the eight hours, no fever, no pain, just tired, but not tired. Like I got to sleep. Like I couldn't hold my eyes open. Each time I woke up, it was like I couldn't keep my eyes open. Like I hadn't slept, but I slept 17, 15, and eight hours. Over three days, that's how it was. But after that, it was just a mild headache. And just weak, like I had no energy for like a week and a half. That's how it was. But it took me like two months to get my full smell and taste back. And I had to do that by eating an orange that I burnt. And I learned that off of a fucking Facebook video that one of my friends sent me. He said, here, scorch this orange. It's going to taste like shit, but do it and see if it works. And it did. I could, I could smell and I could get my taste back. So if you have ever going to get this COVID bullshit, they say, <clears throat> you know, your smell and taste, burn an orange in the peel and then peel the orange, peel back and just eat it. It's not fun. It doesn't taste good, but it brings back your smell and your ability to taste. And there it is. But, but I, after that, I mean, I still didn't, I still did not get sick or er. My wife never got it. None of my kids got it. So if it was transferable, why didn't they get it? What was it? It was something given to me. Because if it was something that was transferable by a cough, if it was something that was transferable by a sneeze, body fluid exchanges, I'm married to my wife, folks. Let's be real. Okay. <laughs> and she didn't get sick. It was given to me. I don't know how it was, but I didn't take a vaccine shot. And I won't do that. And now the same shit that they put in that stuff, 
they're trying to put that in food. Which is what I told my wife. I said, you know, there's a lot of people like me and you where we're not going to take that shot ever. I'm not going to do it. I don't give a fuck what they say. I'm not doing it. And I live an introverted life. So for the folks in this audience who be like, you're, you're an asshole. Fuck you. You should deserve to get it. And you know, I've had people say that to me. I, I already live an introverted life. I don't hang around a lot of people. But when I was out buying stuff, preparing for when I knew this shit was coming, because I was watching China. I was watching all the bullshit that was coming out of there. I was like, okay, this is they're going to bring that shit here. It's going to be a bunch of horse shit. So I was buying up everything I could because I knew there would be a bunch of bullshit with not getting the stuff that we needed, which was the first thing that sells out. If a storm's coming, like a big bad storm, like a hurricane or a big blizzard in our country, the first thing to go is milk, bread, eggs, and toilet paper. So I stocked up on all that shit and canned goods and bottled water and water filters and candles and batteries, extra light bulbs, everything that I would need if shit got upside down for a little while. And it did. It literally happened like that. So all that stuff that they put in these things, RNA horseshit, They're trying to find a way to put that shit in food. And I told my wife, I said, if they're trying to really get it in everybody, the best way to do it would be to put it in the water and put it in food. Hmm. I distill everything I drink. I drink distilled water. If it ain't that, I drink the Evian water, in which I'm stopping drinking that because I'm not trusting that they won't eventually put that shit in there if they haven't already. So I drink distilled water from the distillers I have at my house, which is just a countertop thing. I drink the well water that I distill and there's no fluoride in that. There's no anything in it. It's absolutely perfectly clean water. It's steam that returns back to a liquid. So, man, we've been all over the place tonight, haven't we? Where did I get this energy from? I just did all that live streaming, talked for nothing. Nobody could hear anything after I went to the Euro dollar chart. And now we're talking about <laughs> tinfoil hat shit. I know some of you are like, this is the shit I've been waiting for. Eh, there's not a lot of interest in, <clears throat> interest in this within this huge body of people that are listening to me for trading information. I'm sure I've turned off a lot of you with that, but that's not where we're going with this YouTube and uh, Twitter space stuff. Okay. But I had a lot of folks asking why I'm doing this. Like, why am I doing it? That's the reason why I'm expecting really bad shit to come. I want to be wrong. I want to be able to be laughed at by all of you. 24 months from now, when nothing happens and Bitcoin's at $500,000, I want you all to be able to say, ICT, you are so wrong and laugh at me. I want that to happen. I really want that to happen. Because if I'm not, we are in some shit. Like, we're going to be really uncomfortable. And money isn't going to be the answer. Everybody's life's about to change, man. Everywhere. Some harder than others. And I want to be able to know when I'm feeling all of that pressure, when it's happening to us in our area, in my family members, and me, I want to know that I have at least warned you, provided you a skill set to hopefully be able to do something to maybe alleviate some of it, not all of it, because I don't think it's going to be possible. And then 
you know, hopefully that uh, gives me a little bit more peace of mind. I'll be able to take comfort in it. At least I know I have done something. And I didn't hoard this information. I didn't exclude anybody from it. And I very meaningfully and heart heartfelt effort was placed in this with a good intention. And for the folks that talk about how I'm motivated to get money because of ad revenue, I, the ad revenue helps me afford my kids that do stupid shit. And I'm tired of paying for it out of my pocket. That's the way it is. I got kids, man. I got kids. I got a wife. And they just want to spend. They want to do dumb shit and take chances with their cars. And when that shit happens, they can't afford to do it on their own. So where's the money going to come from? I'm not going to fucking keep doing this shit. So if I can put something out there that makes income, and they, that's right. That's this income stream I'll use for that kind of stuff. It's none of your fucking business, you know, what I'm doing and how I get my money. But <clears throat> for the purposes of telling the folks that genuinely want to know and not have an ulterior motive for it, now you know. But I'm not getting at any ad revenue right now. I'm talking to you for fucking hours. I don't know what time it is. It? Man, I've been going that long. There's no 12.42. <laughs> I literally feel like I've been here for an hour and a half. That's what it feels like for me. If I had enough to talk about and reasons to hold anybody's attention, I could probably be a... Um, I don't know what I'm thinking of. Like a talk show host, but I, and I'm killing talk show hosts. Like, this is longer than a talk show host. Like, maybe a podcaster, something like that. I'm constant, aren't I? This just keeps going on and on and on. Nice motherfucker can talk, can he? Yeah. I don't stop talking until I'm asleep. And I don't sleep very much, so. And to answer the question you probably asked, well, answer that question. I wish you would talk about how you sleep. So I sleep in two segments of four hours. So I sleep four hours. Whenever I wake up after the four hours, and it's usually naturally, I wake up four hours, I get up immediately out of bed, and I start Looking at my charts, I look at whatever I'm looking at for building sentiment, opinions, bias. I look at YouTubers that I like to fade. I like to look at websites and forums that talk about what other traders are expecting, what they think. And then I read the headlines. I just go through the major headlines like you know, Investor's Business Daily, Wall Street Journal. And barons. And all I do is look at the headlines. I do not read the articles because the articles is just bullshit. The headlines is that's them priming you. They're telling you what to think, what to fear, what to worry about. And that's how I stay ahead of everything. I know what they're trying to do because of the bullshit that they try to engineer. So I sleep in four hours. I wake up. Usually anywhere between four hours, four fifteen, like four hours and fifteen minutes, something like that. And then I, I'm I'm up. I'm moving about, doing what I gotta do. And after I'm done talking and having either lunch, doing whatever I'm doing with my wife in the evening or afternoon rather, before our evening time together, I'll lay down again for four hours. So in between those times, if I have an opportunity, and I haven't had that since I've been doing this year, but usually I'll lay down for about 15 to 20 minutes as a, as a cat nap, once or twice a day. But I don't, need, I don't need more than four hours of sleep. And I know there's a lot of people say, oh, no, you, you need to have eight hours of fucking sleep. Man, if I sleep eight hours, I'm dead. Like, I don't have any energy. None. I'm zapped. Like I, I, it's like I've been lulled into laziness and, and sleepy. I don't. I don't operate like that. My obviously, you can. Do I sound like I'm low on energy? <laughs> I'm 50 years old. Okay, but I'm telling you right now, I, I, I'm going and going and going like the Energizer Bunny all night long. Okay, all night long, all day long. 
I don't fucking sleep like the average person. I'll sleep when I'm dead. And I don't have a need for eight hour sleeps. As a younger man, I felt like I had to do that. And I was, I would get sick. I would catch colds all the time. I would always be fucking getting sick. Always. And when I adopted this, and it was a matter of just because of my life and you know, being who I am now, it, it, it grew into, well, four hours is what I could get. So four hours, and then I divided it in the day, and then I found another period of four hours. And sometimes I'm not going to be able to stay on the same sleep schedule. Like I'm not always falling asleep at the same time each day. So I go until I'm tired. As soon as I feel myself, like I said earlier in the beginning, I'm fatigued because of the talking. I'm not tired, tired, but fatigued of talking because I went for as long as I did on that live stream and I hadn't had a break. Like I, I stayed right here. Like I didn't leave my office here. All I did was stood up, stretched for a couple seconds and then sat down and started the stream that I told you that I was going to do in 15 minutes. So I said, no, nah, I got I, I to get it off my chest right now and go. So I don't have that normal sleep routine that all of you have. And I think if I had a job, then I would probably sleep the regular, you know, six to seven, eight hour time. But because I don't do anything like work a stressful job, because you're stressed all the time. You're stressed when you go to bed, worrying about going there. You're worried about that job when you wake up because you got to go there. You're worried about that job when you're commuting there. You're worried about your job when you come home and you're commuting from it. So you're constantly worrying about that shithole of a job and being there. You don't want it. You don't want to do it. I don't have that. So when I wake up, my day is mine. I choose to spend it helping all of you. I choose it to do what I want to do with my children when I'm doing it, walk my dogs, whatever I'm doing. It's not a job. And I'm working harder at doing what I'm doing with you than anybody does at a job. But I don't feel like I'm working. I'm enjoying myself. I'm sharing, I'm talking, I'm being who I am. And, you know, I hope it's you know, viewed as cool to most of you. I, I'm trying to be personable, trying to be, uh, you know, something other than the guy that just talks about charts and shit. Yeah, I'm a real person. I got real family needs and things that go on. I got kids that don't listen to me. <laughs> it's, you know, it's the reality of it. You probably have this opinion or held this view that, you know, everything's together. Everything's balanced. Everything's, it's not. It's not. I mean, I have a family. I have in-laws. I have a mother that, you know, isn't close to my children. She, she has not even seen my two youngest kids except for the day they were born and never seen them since. Could you exist as a grandmother and do that? That's the person that birthed me. She's not supposed to be a mother. She should have never been a mother. But to say that, I wouldn't be here. So it's kind of like a weird thing to say it. But she should have never been a parent. But I have all those things, just like you. I have dysfunctional family members. My in-laws, they cannot manage money. You can't help them. You give them something, they lose it. You give them money, they waste it. You, you, you can't, you can't do anything for them. So, I'm just like everybody else. I have the real world problems that just like you have. And me being able to do what you see me do does not make me exempt of that. I'm a real person that manages all these real issues that happen in everybody else's life. <clears throat> And if I can do this, you'll be able to do it too. You're just going to have to work really, really hard and put your mind to it. But I do believe I need to close this one. Not because I'm tired, because I'm not. I'm probably going to go down there and uh, grab something to drink. Take the girls out, let them go to the bathroom. 
I'm probably gonna go read read some stuff. See what's going on in the world. See what I missed. So tomorrow, Friday, I will not be on Twitter worrying you. And I probably will not be doing anything at all with you on social media until Saturday. So I guess Saturday morning, Shotgun will be here again talking about what? I don't know. <laughs> it, it won't be this long. I'm quite certain of that. But Anyway, if I've kept you company at your job, if I've kept you company wherever you were, you were hanging out with me. Hopefully I was good company with you. Hopefully I uh, entertained you. Hopefully I inspired you to keep digging in and focus on what it is you're doing here, why you're doing it, and what you're going to do with it once you get it. That's what I said I'm interested in. I want to see how you prepare yourself, how you bless others. And that story is what I'm really interested in. So with that, my friends, I'm going to close this one. Wish you all a very pleasant evening, morning, wherever you're at in the world. Until next next time, be safe. Oh, 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 oh,